the Committee on Information Policy, uh, Census, and National Archives will come to, to order. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing entitled the 2010 Master Address Files, Issues and Concerns. Uh, today's hearing will examine the quality and quantity of addresses encompassing the master address file. Uh, before we begin today, I would first like to publicly express uh, my condolences to the family and friends of Bill Sparkman. Uh, Mr. Sparkman was a census worker found murdered in Kentucky. Uh, this incident is extremely unfortunate, unfortunate and immensely troubling. Uh, census workers are doing a great civic duty uh, for their country and it is intolerable that such violations occur. Uh, further, I'd like to commend Director Groves on his efforts and concern for his employees. Uh, it is evident that the safety and well-being of census employees are of paramount concern to him. I, along with the subcommittee, uh, await swift justice for those responsible uh, for such a horrendous act. Uh, also, I'd like to, uh, on another note, I'd like to uh, uh, recognize a, a group of visitors here uh, who are part of the uh, House Democracy Partnership. Uh, we have uh, uh, 24 members of parliament from four countries this week for a seminar on committee operations. Uh, with an emphasis on organizing and holding public hearings. Uh, the uh, visiting members are observing video of a hearing and meeting with House staff and members to discuss the organization and conduct of hearings. Uh, and I want to welcome uh, those members of Parliament here uh, from the country of Kenya as well as Peru uh, welcome, and hopefully you will uh, get something out of this hearing, which I'm sure you will. Uh, and so without further ado, um, on our panel we will hear first from uh, Dr. Robert Groves, Director of the Census Bureau. Dr. Groves will provide the status of the Bureau's ongoing efforts to compile and update the master address file, including Luca and its appeal process, special Gulf Coast initiatives, address canvassing, and group quarter validation. And welcome again, Dr. Groves. Uh, we will then hear from government witnesses who will testify and assess the compilation of the master address file. These witnesses will offer <coughs> recommendations they believe will improve the Bureau's efforts. Our final testimony will come from a stakeholder who will discuss her organization's concerns about Census 2010. She will provide her organization's uh, actual experiences with hard to count populations. She will also offer practical solutions to aid in the partnership between the Bureau and community-based organizations. And without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. And uh, again, the purpose of today's hearing is to examine the master address file. This, this subcommittee is committed to reviewing the daunting and critical task of counting the population. This constitutionally mandated exercise has wide ramifications the results are used to apportion legislative districts at the federal and state level. Moreover, the distribution of more than $400 billion annually in federal assistance to local, state, territorial, and tribal governments rely upon this count. Civic prestige, marketability, and regional political power also rest upon these numbers. As we look forward to April 1, 2010, the subcommittee evaluates the status of the Bureau's efforts to count all inhabitants of this country. 
The master address file is an essential component of the 2010 decennial census. Thus, an assessment of the compilation of addresses is of fundamental interest and concern to the subcommittee. Today's hearing will focus on the Bureau's progress in the compilation, scheduling, cost, and transparency of the master address file. The subcommittee will explore all aspects of MA of master address file, including, but not limited to LUCA, the LUCA appeal process, address canvassing, update leave, special Gulf Coast initiatives, uh, and budgetary matters. The Bureau's interaction and cooperation with local and county governments, community organizations, and stakeholders will further be explored. The success of the census is dependent on the quality of the address list. Uh, I thank the witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimony. I now yield to the distinguished ranking minority member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, all of you who are participating in this, and thank you very much for our guests. I, I hope you find this informative and, and uh, appreciate your joining us here today. Uh, as we work on this uh, very daunting, huge, uh, massive task of, of trying to count every person in the United States of America, our timeline is short. Here we have less than six months to go, and, and undoubtedly the challenges will be huge. Um, a particular concern that I'd like to make sure is, you know, are we up to the task of making sure that everyone is, is fairly counted, that they're not undercounted and they're not overcounted, um, and that we have the tools necessary and the technology in place in order to make that happen. Uh, I have specific questions and concerns about the uh, viability of the workforce that is being hired in order to do this enumeration, specifically um, the practice of hiring known criminals. I know the background checks and the fingerprinting have been an issue, and I appreciate an update along the way in, in that regard. Uh, and then I also have questions as to why we don't, or to what degree we do, uh, utilize and tap into what we already do in the United States Postal Service. They already have a federal workforce of hundreds of thousands of people who go to every home, uh, every address uh, in this country. I recognize some have post office boxes and whatnot, and there, there are certain challenges with illegally subdivided homes and whatnot, as uh, Ms. Jacobs, I'm sure, will, will address. But with that being said, uh, mapping out this country, uh, why we are not more closely aligned with a, a uh, literally hundreds of thousands of people who do this on an almost everyday uh, basis uh, is something I think we, is worth uh, at least a few questions along the way. Uh, and so I look forward to your testimony. I appreciate the interaction today. It's what this process is all about. And I, I thank the chairman for the time. I thank back. the gentleman from Utah and uh, the, with Mr. Westmoreland here for make an opening. No, thank you. Okay, then if there are no additional opening statements, uh, we will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. And uh, I want to start by introducing our panel. We will hear first uh, from Dr. Robert Groves, Director of the Census Bureau. Dr. Groves has authored numerous books and articles. He was a recipient of the prestigious Julius Shiskin Memorial Award in 2008. He has a BA from Dartmouth and a Master's in Sociology sociology and statistics, uh, and further earned a doctorate from Michigan. Dr. Groves' book, Non-Response in Household Interview Surveys, with Mick Cooper received the 2008 AAPOR Book Award. Uh, Dr. Groves began his tenure as director on July 15, 2009. Next, we will hear from Mr. Robert Goldenkopf, who currently serves as the, as the director of strategic issues at the Government Accountability Office. Mr. Goldenkopf is responsible for reviewing the 2010 Census and government-wide human capital reform. He has also developed a body of work related to transportation security, combating human trafficking, and federal statistical program. Mr. Goldenkopf's various works have been published uh, in the Public Administration Review, Policy Studies Journal, Government Executive, and Technology Review. Thank you for being here. Next, we will hear from Mr. Todd Zinzer, Inspector General of the, the Department of Commerce. As Inspector General, Mr. Zinzer leads a team of auditors, evaluators, investigators, attorneys, and administrative staff responsible for promoting economy and efficiency in detecting and preventing fraud, waste, and, and abuse in the vast array of businesses 
uh, scientific, economic, and environmental programs administered uh, by the department and its 13 bureaus. Thank you, Mr. Zinser, for, for coming today. Our final witness will, meet, will be Ms. Eileen Jacobs from California Rural Legal Assistance. Ms. Jacobs is the Director of Litigation Advocacy and Training. She has spent 30 years of her legal career as an advocate for housing and civil rights in low-income communities in urban and rural Missouri, uh, uh, United States. Ms. Jacobs taught housing law for the U UC Davis Law School and Women and the Law for Yuba Community College. She obtained her BA from Boston University and JD from the uh, Northwestern University School of Law. She has co-authored two publications on the undercount of farm workers and indigenous groups in the census. Ms. Jacobs is the CRLA delegate to the National 2010 Census Advisory Committee, for which she is chair of an ad hoc subcommittee on hard to locate housing units. Uh, thank you all uh, for appearing before the subcommittee today. Uh, it is the policy of the subcommittee uh, that all witnesses, b before they testify, uh, be sworn in. And can I ask you to stand? I'd like to ask, uh, uh, I'd like to ask you to raise your right hand and, uh, and repeat after me. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the win witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you will have an opportunity to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. Uh, the yellow light will indicate that it will be time to sum up, and that red light will indicate that your time has expired. Uh, Dr. Groves, uh, you may proceed first. Thank you. Chairman Clay, uh, Ranking Member Chaffetz, other subcommittee members, I'm, I'm happy to be here to testify um, with regard to the master address file for the 2010 census. I, um, when I testified here on uh, September 22nd, I noted uh, at that time a set of professional judgments about the assessment of the 2010 preparations. And I noted at the end of this month, we'd be uh, finished with our internal evaluation, the master address file. I realized the uh, schedules of the committee didn't work uh, to uh, hit that time exactly right. I'll tell you as much as we know, I promise uh, today, but there's still work to be done and I'd be happy to meet with uh, the full committee or any subset uh, that uh, when we have that full report ready. Let, uh, let me begin by reminding us of what the master address file is. It, it is literally an inventory of all the addresses and descriptions of uh, units uh, uh, along with their geographical locations. It is the source of the mailing of all the questionnaires and delivery of decennial forms. So it is a big deal for the 2010 census and the quality of that master address file is appropriately a target of this subcommittee's scrutiny. There are three major quality criteria that, that I'll talk about today. One is its completeness, its coverage. Do, does it contain all of the uh, housing units in the United States? Secondly, are the addresses on each of those housing units complete? Can we mail, or, or the physical descriptions, can we mail or find the housing units in our later operations? And then third, uh, do we know where these units are? Is the spatial accuracy what, what we need to uh, have for a successful census? We've done three important things over the decade. I think it's important to know that uh, we're designed to improve the quality of the master address file. The first thing that was done is a reflection of what happened in 2000. There was a result of the 2000 census that there were more duplicates in this frame than were expected. One source of the duplicates was, had to do with uh, group quarters housing units, and we've blended those two lists together with the hope that that will reduce the kind of duplication we found in 2000. We've realigned all the, uh, the streets and roads in the country to reflect uh, uh, changes over the decade, 
And we're fully using, in cooperation with the Postal Service, uh, codes that determine how best to get, to get uh, forms to particular addresses, whether we should mail them or deliver them ourselves. We've also been updating this frame throughout the decade uh, through, again, a cooperation with the Postal F Service on the delivery sequence file, and then through our own field work in the American Community Survey and other surveys, uh, to, uh, especially in rural areas. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned uh, the so-called LUCA program, which is a local update of census addresses. Uh, it plays, as you know, a critical role. It's a key, uh, both symbolic and real, cooperation with uh, local and state governments throughout uh, the country, as well as tribal governments. Uh, this is an important part of building the master address file. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you, along with Representative Maloney, uh, former ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Michael Turner, uh, Representative Michael Thompson, and a former ranking uh, member of the full committee, uh, Representative Tom Davis, for your support last year. You wrote a dear colleague letter uh, in March, and you helped to spread the word about the LUCA program to your colleagues uh, on the Hill, and it helped, uh, as you'll see in just a few minutes. We invited in 2007 uh, about 40,000 different tribal, state, and local governments to participate in this local program. About 12,000, 11,500 of them registered. About 29% of the governments uh, are represented by that 11,000. That's a disappointing number when you first see that, but those governments represent about 92% of the housing units in the country. So that's kind of the first evaluation of LUCA uh, that one could mount. And one way to evaluate it is to compare it to what happened in 2000. In 2000, uh, we had about 18,000 governments registered. They represented less than 92% of the total housing units uh, in the country. So. Overall, on participation in LUCA, we had greater participation this decade than last, and that's something that uh, we are grateful for. We received submissions uh, reflecting changes to our address list from those local governments from about 79% of the governments that had registered. Uh, that's about 8,100 governments. This compares to about 67% um, uh, submission in the 98 uh, LUCA and 48 percent in the 99 LUCA. So once again, the participation, the submission of these lists to us from the local governments was uh, somewhat better than in 2000, another good sign. We then matched these uh, addresses supplied by local governments against the master address file, and we sent out all those addresses uh, for, the advance, uh, for the address canvassing operation that took place in the summer. Uh, let me mention a couple of things about other improvements in the local update program. We had a single cycle of review. This, this reduced the complexity of uh, participating governments. We had a longer review period, 120 days versus 90. Uh, we allowed um, a variety of ways to participate that seemed to fit the, the different problems local governments uh, were facing. We provided uh, easy-to-use software uh, that they could download on their desktops to help. And for the first time, we allowed state governments to represent lower governments uh, within their states. That partially explains the lower count of participation of governments, but the higher percentage of uh, housing units represented. The preliminary figures from uh, this program show that about 8 million addresses were provisionally added to the master address file uh, for verification. 30 million of the addresses submitted by the local update program matched addresses already on the file. And we had 2 million corrections to addresses. Then as you know, um, over the summer in 2009, Census Bureau staff walked every street and road in the country and visited 145 million locations that, con that consisted uh, of uh, the 145 million uh, units on, on the then master address file. The only areas that were omitted from this were remote Alaska and parts of Maine. 
that represent about 35,000 households of the, of the uh, 134 million. Uh, I can give you the results of these, uh, uh, of the address canvassing work. About 98 million addresses on that list of 145 million were verified as is. Uh, 20 million were corrected. Usually that was a street name correction, small changes. 5 million were moved to another block. 10 million were added. They weren't on the address list before and they weren't on the LUCA uh, submission list. So at the current time, the master address file consists of about 134 million records. That turns out to match independent estimates of the housing unit count. That's a good, good sign so far in our comparisons. Uh, the, the figures show that about 21 million addresses fall into either a delete or duplicate or non-residential category. 16 million of those were deletes. That is, we couldn't find them when we got out there. Um, and about four million were duplicates uh, that were found from other, uh, 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 found to exist in other places in, in the master address file. About a million of the addresses we had on the list were non-residential. They've now been omitted. Two million of them were, uh, were what we called other living quarters. These are things like assisted living facilities, dormitories, group homes. And we sort of set those aside. And right now, as we speak, there are people visiting those group quarters because that was a problem in 2000, making sure we had all the unit identifications right in those group facilities. We're out there right now making sure we have correct unit identifiers. And that's going to pay off uh, uh, come spring when we do uh, the measurement. Um, with respect to the results of uh, address canvassing on the local update cases themselves, our initial results show that about 66% of the LUCA addresses uh, were deleted, identified as duplicate, or found to be non-residential. About 29% of the addresses were verified, corrected, or moved, and about 5% were unresolved in address canvassing. Uh, but will remain in the enumeration universe. We're now reviewing this operation, uh, as I said at the opening, uh, and I'm happy to get back to you when we have all of the evaluative results uh, on that program. You know that we have other programs that uh, will improve, uh, hopefully, the master address file. We're right now out asking these same local governments to give us uh, uh, new construction updates. We've invited about 29,000 governments to participate in this. Uh, about uh, 15,000 have already said yes, and we're off and running on that. We are also going to make other updates to this file. Uh, we're not through for 2010. Uh, we will get other updates from the U.S. Postal Service, from the delivery sequence file. We're going to have a count review program that's going to go out uh, early in, in 2010, and then we're going to have updates uh, from other field operations. Um, our attempt in this is to get the most up-to-date master address file we can. So let me sum up. I said there are three evaluative uh, criteria for the master address file coverage. Uh, is first, relative to 2000, I noted that fewer governments participated in, in the local update program, but they represented a higher proportion of uh, all addresses in the country than, than 2000. I noted that state and local governments provided addresses that form about 2% uh, of the total valid addresses on the file after address canvassing. And after address canvassing, the total number of units on the file is comparable to an independent estimate of the count of housing units in the country. The second criteria is the completeness of address, uh, addresses. And we, we found about 2 million other living quarters that are now being revisited to get those addresses right, those identifiers right. Uh, we're expecting a lot of these to revert to a single housing unit uh, by the time we're through with this operation. 
We continue to evaluate the current status of the uh, master address file, and I'm hopeful that I could uh, talk more about this uh, in, a, in a later hearing in front of this committee. I thank the committee uh, for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Groves. We know you, um, you hit the ground running at the Census uh, Bureau, and we thank you for your service. Mr. Golden Cough, you recognize five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the Census Bureau's progress in building a complete and accurate address list. As you know, a quality address list, along with precise maps, are key to a successful census. If the Bureau's address list and maps are inaccurate, people can be missed, counted more than once, or included in the wrong location. That said, compiling an accurate address list is no easy task. One reason for this is that people can reside in hidden and non-traditional housing units such as converted attics and basements, as well as in cars, boats, trailers, motels, tent cities, and labor camps. While these living arrangements have long existed, the large number of foreclosures the nation has recently experienced, as well as the natural disasters that have hit the Gulf Coast and other regions, have likely increased the number of people living in less conventional housing. In addition to housing units, which include single-family homes, apartments, and mobile homes, many people also reside in facilities called group quarters, which include prisons, dormitories, nursing homes, and similar locations. The Bureau's database of the nation's roughly 140 million addresses is called the Master Address File, or MAF. As requested, my testimony will describe the preliminary results of three MAF building operations that can help locate hidden housing units and other traditionally hard to count populations. The operations we reviewed are LUCA, address canvassing, and group quarters validation. I will also provide an update on the IT systems the Bureau will use to update and extract information from the MAF database. My testimony today has two main points. First, the Bureau goes to great lengths to ensure the accuracy of the address file using multiple operations that include partnerships with the Postal Service, extensive field verifications, and numerous other activities. Second, the operations we reviewed generally proceeded as planned, and we did not observe any significant operational setbacks. Still, the overall effectiveness of the Bureau's efforts will not be known until later in the Census when the Bureau completes various assessments. Turning first to LUCA, the Bureau partnered with state, local, and tribal governments tapping into their knowledge of local populations and, and housing conditions in order to develop a more complete and accurate address list. More than 8,000 jurisdictions participated in the program between November 2007 and March 2008. However, Lucas submissions generated a relatively small percentage of additions to the math. For example, of around 36 million potential additions that locality submitted, just 2.4 million, or 7%, were new addresses not already in the MAF. The others were duplicate addresses, non-existent, or non-residential. Address canvassing finished ahead of schedule, in part because of improvements the Bureau made to the handheld computers used to collect data, as well as because of lower than expected employee turnover. Nevertheless, the operation exceeded its original budget estimate of $356 million by $88 million, a cost overrun of 25%. A key reason for the overrun was that the Bureau did not update its cost estimates to reflect changes to the address canvassing workload. Further, the Bureau did not follow its staffing strategy and hired too many listers. Recognizing the difficulties associated with address canvassing in the hurricane-affected areas along the Gulf Coast, the Bureau developed supplemental training materials to help listers identify addresses where people are or may be living when census questionnaires are distributed early next year. For example, the materials noted that people might be living in trailers, homes marked for demolition, and non-residential spaces such as storage areas above restaurants. To help ensure group quarters are accurately included in the census, the Bureau is conducting an operation called group quarters validation, which is going on right now. The Census Bureau developed and tested new procedures to improve how it identifies and counts these facilities based on lessons learned from the 2000 Census. With respect to the automated system that supports the MAF, although the Bureau has improved aspects of its IT management, we continue 
to be concerned about the lack of finalized test plans, incomplete metrics to gauge progress, and an aggressive testing and implementation schedule going forward. In summary, the Bureau has taken extraordinary measures to produce a quality address list and associated maps. Still, accurately locating each and every dwelling in the nation is an inherently challenging endeavor and the overall quality of the Bureau's address list will not be known until later in the census when the Bureau completes the, the assessments that Dr. Groves mentioned. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my remarks and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Golden Cup. Mr. Zinzer, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today about the Census Bureau's master address file. My testimony covers three points, Mr. Chairman. First, the building the master addre address file is an enormously important and enormously complex undertaking. Second, my office has focused a lot of our work on the census operations used to build the file, and not surprisingly, given the enormity of the task, the operations are prone to errors, errors and omissions. Third, is census continues to work very hard to carry out operations to improve the master address file and compensate for those errors and omissions, and the execution of those operations is critically important. The Census Bureau describes an accurate, comprehensive, and timely list as one of the best predictors of a successful census. Errors on the master address file can cause people to be missed or counted more than once, as well as increased costs and the public burden by requiring enumerators to visit non-existent or duplicate locations during the non-response follow-up operation. After the 2000 census, the Bureau launched an ambitious plan to maintain and update both the master address file and the census maps through a variety of operations. They accomplished some of their plans, but still relied on a massive address canvassing operation at the end of the decade as the primary operation for verifying, updating, or deleting addresses, adding missing addresses, updating streets on the maps, and geocoding every structure. Address canvassing employed 140,000 temporary workers and cost over $400 million, not including the costs of the handheld computers. Our work over the decade on the master address file has identified consistent problems. We observed the 2006 site test in Austin in the Cheyenne River Reservation, the 2008 dress rehearsal, and the address canvassing operation itself. My written statement includes examples of the types of errors and omission we observed in those operations, including missing, duplicate, and erroneous master address file addresses, problems with listers not following procedures, and other problems with process and execution. Our work in this area has caused us to have concerns about the overall quality of the address list. The Census Bureau has operations designed to update the 2009 address list and potentially mitigate some of the issues that affect master address file reliability. These include group quarters validation, the LUCA appeals process, new construction ads, and update leave and update enumerate. These represent some of the most significant efforts planned and underway to strengthen and update the master address file. It is critically important that the Bureau execute these operations well. I believe the Census is working hard to do so. However, if we were to be asked what other actions the Census Bureau could take at this point, we would offer two suggestions that could assess the quality of the master address file right now and provide information that could be used in subsequent improvement operations and potentially provide the opportunity for additional address list corrections. First, census should take advantage of housing unit estimates to help assess master address file quality. For the past 20 years, the Bureau has produced annual estimates of housing units for states, counties, and local governments. These statistics are used as controls for several Census Bureau surveys and could be used for the decennial as benchmarks against which potential over or undercounting of housing could be measured. For example, after Census 2000, count comparisons for over 800 of the nation's most rural counties indicated potential undercoverage in 275 of the counties. Use of housing estimates could identify these types of discrepancies now before the decennial census and perhaps steps could be taken to address them. Second, the Bureau could make greater use of administrative records as another source for checking address quality. Such records collected by all levels of government and the private sector are used by census in conducting several of its statistical operations. 
By matching current administrative records to the master address file, census could both assess master address file quality and potentially add missing addresses. Even if the Bureau determines that incorporating missed addresses identified in this process would not be feasible at this stage of the decennial, there would still be benefits to assessing the address file and identifying areas where addresses are missing. It would allow subsequent field operations to be alerted on a targeted basis of the high potential for an accurate list for that area and the need for greater attention to those areas. Mr. Chairman, this completes my summary and I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Zenzer. Um, Ms. Jacob, you, you may thank proceed. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Ranking Member McHenry and members of the subcommittee for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today about the master address file and to recommend improvements with respect to the development of the master address file. I was glad to hear Dr. Groves refer to the master address file as a big deal, and I'd like to reiterate his statement. It is a very big deal, uh, particularly to the very hard-to-count populations that we represent throughout the 21 rural offices of California Rural Legal Assistance. Our mission is to ameliorate rural poverty and to ensure that rural communities have access to justice and the provision of basic human rights. Therefore, we very much understand the importance of an accurate census and having accurate census data, which starts with an accurate master address file. And I'd like to speak about the adverse impact in the communities we represent of having a less than accurate master address file and make some very practical recommendations for improvements. We represent the hardest to count populations in the hardest to locate housing. We represent farm workers, the rural poor, immigrants, very diverse racial and ethnic groups, linguistically isolated populations, elderly, disabled, and most recently, many foreclosure victims throughout rural California. An inaccurate master address file in a mail-out, mail-back census means that our clients do not have adequate housing, they lack health care, they don't have job training, they have fewer educational opportunities, lower literacy, they have fewer needed municipal services like basic water and sewer, they lack community and economic development programs and resources, and it's harder to enforce the fundamental rights um, that they have guaranteed by law. The direct impact on local government is very serious because they lack the ability to meet the pressing needs of the hardest to count populations. There are social and economic costs, not only to our clients, but to the local governments that are there to serve them. My prepared statement describes the structural bias in the development of the master address file. My involvement with the Census Bureau and concern about the master address file started when, in, after the 1990 census, we participated in a study that measured an at least 50 percent what we called mega undercount of migrant and seasonal farm workers. And we attribute much of that mega undercount to missing housing units, uh, not exclusively, but a significant part of that. And the structural bias uh, in the development of the master address file has not been solved. I give a lot of credit to the Census Bureau for making improvements in instructions to address listers about hidden housing units and what types of units to include in the address file, but we still have the problem of complete omission of entire households because in the hardest to count areas, in areas of high concentration of hidden housing units, the master address file is incomplete. And if the master address file for 2010 is incomplete, that means that the master address file for use in the American Community Survey, Census Bureau's replacement for the long form, also will be incomplete. And that will result not only in omission of housing units, but omission of, of people, and it will carry into the American Community Survey a skewed set of demographic characteristics of the most needy populations, particularly diverse racial and ethnic groups, and the hardest to count populations that we represent. I have made five key points and five key recommendations in our written testimony. 
First, the hard to locate housing units in rural California and elsewhere need to be understood. They are backyard chicken coops. They are illegal garages. They are tool sheds that are rented out to families to live in. They are single family units and apartments that are subdivided into essentially one room uh, per complex household, and that can be a family or an extended family per room in a six apartment dwelling. They are motel rooms that are occupied by 20 migrant and seasonal farm workers at a time. They are trailer encampments. They are tarps and lean-tos built into canyons. And the kind of housing that is unacceptable in this country, but nevertheless, it is spread throughout rural California. And there are many similarities to concentrated urban areas when we talk about these hidden and illegal uh, housing units. And in our study after the 2000 census, and I refer to that in my written testimony, uh, we found that a very high percentage of these types of units were missed in the seven communities that we evaluated using the Census Bureau's methodology. Secondly, address canvassing does not adequately identify these units, albeit improvements um, have been made. Thirdly, ultimately, as I said, it skews the population profile because the hidden units tend to be occupied by the hardest to count populations um, who then become very difficult to profile in the American Community Survey. This has a direct impact on all of our communities throughout the country, and it can be addressed in 2010 and in the ACS. We first recommend that the Census Bureau adopt the address listing protocol that we used in 2000 in the LA region to count migrant and seasonal farm worker units um, and hidden units, that they implement this address listing protocol, which was recognized by the GAO in its report on farm workers and would extend to other hard to count populations. Second, that the Census Bureau work with the regional offices, census partners, community-based organizations, and local governments to identify areas of high concentrations of hard-to-locate housing units and target those for toolkit enumeration operations. And by that, I mean specifically utilizing update leave and update enumerate operations within mail out, mail back areas, not only in remote areas, because that is where the update leave and update enumerate type operations are utilized. I think they can be effectively utilized within hard to count um, and, and mail out, mail back areas. We also should be using the knowledge of community-based organizations in the LUCA process, which presently the Census Bureau does not do. And the master address file should be evaluated in 2010 in areas of a high concentration of hard to locate housing units. That evaluation then could be used to carry over the best practices into the American Community Survey. I know I've run out of time, and I apologize for that. There's a lot more I could say, but I won't. I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Perhaps we will have questions, but thank you, Ms. Jacobs, and thank the entire panel for the testimony. I will now go to the ranking member uh, who has an opening statement and you can also proceed into your questions. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming back and testifying. Uh, uh, Dr. Groves, Mr. Goldenkoff in particular, uh, who have been uh, regular um, in, in being with us, and I certainly appreciate that. Dr. Groves, thank you for following through on your commitment to testify frequently and keep us um, uh, apprised of the process. Uh, and I do appreciate uh, all the efforts that you've made. Um, but uh, I do think that there's been some troubling news that we've seen since the Senate hearing on October 7th um, and that this committee was not previously made aware of. Uh, first, the cost overruns, the significant cost overruns. I know they're not available, uh, the cost estimates for uh, address canvassing your last testimony, Dr. Groves, but certainly 25 percent uh, 
uh, going over budget by 25 percent is, is very significant. Second, uh, although Dr. Groves had informed us at last census hearing that better cost estimation and control was needed, the Bureau admitted on October 7th that its models were grossly inadequate and can translate into future budgetary problems if not immediately addressed. Third, uh, as the GAO study found that the uh, Bureau's fingerprinting process for temporary workers was deeply flawed and potentially uh, and could potentially result in criminals being hired as enumerators. Uh, and while I'm disappointed that these issues were not brought to our attention, I have no doubt that the Bureau is, is actively working uh, to go through and create plans, operating procedures and, and budgets that are uh, accurate and proper. Um, but having said that, there are some successes, as the GAO report indicates, and as Dr. Groves' testimony um, uh, indicates as well. Uh, the timely and comprehensive completion of address canvassing was certainly a huge success. Uh, and the partnership programs and media campaign efforts uh, have been conducted at an unprecedented uh, level, as no previous census has seen, uh, reaching out to diverse groups of people across this country. Uh, and the first major wave of recruitment has met with an applicant pool that was much larger and more qualified than expected. Uh, although the GAO outlines some challenges with that as well. Uh, the Bureau has also started with the 2010 local updated census addresses, LUCA, as, as uh, you all have testified to, uh, that it's been the most effective to date. That is certainly uh, good news, and updating the master address file uh, with that uh, information is certainly good. I want to reiterate my commitment to ensure that, this, uh, that the Bureau stays on track with its planning and execution, uh, execution of the 2010 census. Uh, Dr. Groves, you, you should um, not limit your your communication on issues of concern to just public hearings. We'd certainly appreciate uh, whatever updates you can give us so that certain things like uh, the over the budget overrun, uh, we don't have to find out, uh, find out about through uh, newspapers. Um, and as Chairman Clay has said, and I will reiterate, our doors are open. And I think you'll find that not just the ranking member and the chairman on this committee have their doors open, but all the committee members. We want to make sure that this is the most accurate census in our nation's history. And I think we have the capacity to do that. As uh, Mr. Metzenborg and Dr. Groves have testified, that is their intent and the Bureau's intent. And so thank you uh, for your testimony. And I look forward to uh, hearing your answers to questions. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, would you like me to just go right into questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Groves, uh, rehiring uh, the temporary workers uh, that did the address canvassing, I know that's certainly what you've testified to before. Uh, in terms of fingerprinting, what procedure will these rehires go through? I want to make sure I get the question. Are you looking forward to non-response follow-up? Yes, I'm thinking? sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm okay. sorry. Going forward, when, when you know, approximately 570,000, 600,000 uh, are, are hired for the non-response follow-up, you'll be taking uh, applicant pool, uh, applicants from the original address canvassing pool first, of course, uh, because they've gone through the uh, Bureau of Training. Um, what is the procedure to, uh, to check their criminal records? Um, well, we, we will, uh, let me step back a couple of steps to make sure that I'm uh, answering your question uh, fully. Uh, the, the procedures uh, on, the, on the fingerprinting are going through uh, a critical review right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to change some of those pr procedures in, uh, with the aspiration that we reduce the, uh, the problem that we found in address canvassing, which was a failure to read uh, fingerprints from some, some people. Uh, the, uh, I, I want to remind the committee that the process by which we go, uh, by which we hire someone, involves first their submission and verification of IDs that uh, provide a social security number, a name, uh, sex, uh, and we submit that to the FBI. No, no one has worked on the decennial census, nor will work on the decennial census, without passing that name check. Sure. Uh, that will remain true. Okay. In 2000, only that check was used, and now we're adding this fingerprinting process. Well, we've added the fingerprinting 
procedure, and, and I'm sure there are other questions about this procedure, and we'll get to that. But will all these folks that are rehired, that have, you know, uh, for uh, uh, non-response follow-up, will they be re-fingerprinted, or will you use their original fingerprint and resubmit it? it it's our current uh, intention to use, for those who had fingerprints read, submitted, accepted by the FBI, we will use those those prints. For those who didn't have reads on their fingerprints, we will again go through the fingerprinting process. Okay. And uh, now I should note that not all of them will be rehired, though. Uh, uh, many of them have gotten other mm -hmm. jobs and so on. We will, uh, th the exact proportion of rehires versus new hires isn't really known at this okay. point. And it, it, the procedure with those that have fingerprints that cannot be read, will they be hired like they were hired yeah, uh, in this that's address the change we're after? I, I, um, I don't know how strongly I can say this, Congressman, but um, the, the safety of the U.S. public is of paramount interest to us, um, and I'm committed to doing everything we can to achieve that. We've been working with the FBI after address canvassing, and we've made various changes. And uh, they, they are, uh, under the guidance of the FBI, you know, what, what happens is that as you age, as all of us age, uh, our fingerprints get harder to read. Sure. The, the people who didn't have red fingerprints tend to be older and tend to be female, empirically. Yeah. So older women have uh, harder problems okay. in, in getting Dr. fingerprints. Right? My, People, my time is limited, and I, I know this I'm is sorry. important, but um, if, if you could submit for, for this I'd be happy to give you a detailed list of things we're doing. Because I, I, think, in the, I think the GAO in, in their report would like to see that as well. Happy I, to I have so. another additional thing. I read in USA, USA Today yesterday uh, that the, uh, the expected – Response rate for males uh, for for mail, uh, the uh, the the initial form that will be mailed out on Census Day, is 64 percent. This is uh, I think new information. Uh, it was 67 percent in 2000. Uh, there have been some uh, very substantial changes in that we're uh, we're remailing, in essence. Uh, uh, those that do not uh, respond via mail, and uh, which was not done in 2000. So the response rate was supposed to be better than it was in 2000 because of that procedure alone. Why, um, why has this been reduced? Okay. Three percent would each equal over $100 million by the initial cost estimates that we have. So it's, it's real money we're talking about. And I want to understand why this yeah. wasn't brought to our attention earlier and what your answer is on that as well. Yeah, first of all, I... Uh, the 64 percent number um, I didn't approve, so I didn't know where that, that number came from. We are actually estimating that number over and over again. That's a number that will be re-estimated uh, over the coming months. Uh, secondly, um, it's important and relevant for the committee to know that the response rates of every major national survey in the United States and every Western country is declining. Those response rates are declining each year. The American Community Survey yeah. on the mail return rate is declining at between 0.5 and 1 percentage point a year. We have a population that's tougher to measure than it was in 2000. Yeah. We have indeed put in the design features you talked about that go in the other direction that should push it up. But the big change in the population is a massive rock to push up the hill, and we don't know yet how well these design features will work. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I read the press report. It says Census Bureau analysis, which um, I, well, I'd like to know what, what report. Well, I'd like to see what, what you would submit as uh, in, in uh, what you think the result would yeah. be, uh, because I certainly – with your history, I, you, you certainly are special, have specialized knowledge in this. We'd like to have that. I'd Just, be happy to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, Dr. Groves, we know that the accuracy of the master address list relies heavily on close partnerships between the Bureau and local governments. Uh, looking to the future, 
This partnership will again be called upon year after year to help the Bureau produce accurate annual estimates. Uh, we know that the Bureau is altering the census challenge methodology. Uh, will the census be working with local government officials like planners in developing the new methodology? And if so, uh, how? Uh, I want to make sure I understand the question, Congressman. Are, are you talking about the Population Estimates Program? Yes. Or, okay. Um, well, a, as you know, um, the, the, the Population Estimates Program is undergoing review. Uh, we've had outside experts in. I'm very interested in this program to get to, to improve it over the coming decade. We're going to have a lot more dialogue about how best to do that. It's a set of technical issues about how in the middle of the decade you can get the best estimates. Uh, the procedures that have been used uh, to work with cooperatively with communities to update those estimates are worth reviewing. There are complaints kind of on both sides that ought to be aired, and, and uh, I want that to happen, and I can assure you that that will be an open process. Can the uh, new construction program be expanded to include all additional addresses that cities might have missed in the LUCA process? Well, as you know, the, the new construction program is limited to those uh, uh, local governments that have access uh, to, to new construction administrative records. And uh, that's a smaller set than, for example, the state governments aren't used for that, that purpose. Uh, right now, under the current uh, legislation, we're limited to governmental entities providing us those updates. Uh, but the world is changing, and it's worth talking about uh, the future in, in various ways. You know, we are aware uh, that the census plans to hand deliver 1.2 million questionnaires to residents in the Gulf region. Uh, this is a great start, uh, but my concern is the follow-up with the lack of mail receptacles uh, and home telephone service in some of the affected areas, uh, what additional, additional measures will be taken uh, for non-response follow-up? You know, Congressman, I, was, I just spent yesterday at our facility that's assembling the packets for the update. The, we call this update leave. Uh, it's really cool. You ought to do that sometime, visit it sometime. But there are big plastic bags uh, that contain little plastic bags that have questionnaires and a letter from me inside. Mm -hmm. So they're protected from the rain. They have little uh, hooks on them, so you could hook it inside a screen door if you don't have a mailbox of a house that's clearly inhabitable. Thinking of the Gulf Coast areas you were sure. just talking about. So I, I think we're thinking about uh, the same things, and, mm -hmm. and so far I think we're prepared for that. Um, and I, I can't wait to see how, how well that works. It's an area that's rapidly changing, as you know. I know on, on one of my uh, field visits to the Gulf Coast region, uh, I was told by census workers that they, in some areas, they have to take boats into the bayou and other places in order to actually um, I guess verify addresses first, and now I guess they will have to drop those packages yeah. off by you, boat also. You would not believe the kind of uh, transportation our enumerators are seeking. So we also had a request for mules on some Indian reservations because okay. you literally cannot drive a four-wheel drive vehicle up to some of the lodging. Okay. So we do a lot of uh, efforts that are unusual. Wow, you, you are really preparing for this, aren't you? <laughs> uh, please detail the update and lead program that is utilized in rural and Gulf Coast areas. Upon recognition of the addresses of hidden housing units, uh, will there be enough time to input these found addresses before non-response follow-up? Um, I want to get your question right. Could you repeat that? I want to make sure I answer Detail exactly. Detail the update leave, leave the program okay. that is you, um, you re utilizing rural and Gulf regions. The, uh, in, in the Gulf Coast area, say take New Orleans, in, 
in Orleans, uh, Plaquemines, and St. Bernard parishes. These were almost all mail out, mail back in 2000. With the collaboration of local government and civic leaders, we've identified uh, all three of those parishes are gonna be entirely update leave. So we'll have people on the streets going structure by structure. Uh, when a structure, according to a set of fixed rules, is defined as habitable, uh, they will put uh, a questionnaire on those structures. In areas of St. Tammany Parish, the same thing will happen. So as, as you get away from the coast, things get a little better, and there are certain areas that will do update leave, but they may be surrounded by areas that are mail out, mail back, and all of this is done uh, is designed to be done in conjunction with local leaders who, who know what's happening. Uh, this is a rapidly changing thing. People are building houses uh, now in New Orleans mm -hmm. especially, and we have to be very current to get it right. And you, you, you did say St. Bernard Parish. St. Bernard is fully uh, update leave. Well, it, it just, it just um, causes me to ask the question then, uh, could this technique be applied in hard to count urban areas? Uh, it, it could indeed, and uh, a, a thing that's uh, new, actually this is relevant to Ms. Jacobs' testimony, mm -hmm. um, one thing that is greatly expanded this decade I think is really something that's neat, and that is uh, for all of the census tracts, these are things that small geographical areas that were found to be hard to enumerate in 2000, um, there's a special plan for every track. Uh, we have people who've, who've already driven every street of those hard to enumerate tracks, and they've looked at every house in the track, and they've asked the question, how best to enumerate this area? If it's a mail out, mail back area that they're concerned about, they'll do uh, separate outreach efforts to encourage response. If there are other things going on, they have the freedom to tailor some of the methods they'll use. I'm very hopeful that this kind of customization down to the local level could pay off. Sounds impressive. Thank you for your response. Uh, we will now go to the gentleman from Georgia. Five minutes, Mr. Westmoreland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first question is for Ms. Jacobs. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, in your uh, written testimony here, I noted that I guess it was in 2003, your organization uh, identified approximately 4,000 units that were not in the MAF, and, uh, and this was before Mr. Groves, but uh, with your working with the Census Bureau, I think about 75% of them, or a little over 3,000 of them, were included in the MAF. Was this a satisfactory outcome for, for you? Thank you for the question, Mr. Westmoreland. We were, of course, thrilled with that outcome, but that outcome was, first of all, limited to the Los Angeles region, and second of all, it was based on a program that we undertook um, through our education and outreach program in 2000 um, and funded research uh, that was unusual, and it was, I would say unique and it has not been otherwise applied by the Census Bureau. We had census outreach workers who were hired by our organization identifying um, units that we thought had been missed or were highly likely to be missed and it was only because the LA region was willing to cooperate in developing this address listing protocol with us and was willing to then take our 4,000 units back, compare them to the master address file to which we had no access, of course, and then able to add units. But that was not something that had been um, necessarily approved by headquarters, nor has it since been implemented by headquarters, nor has it been approved or implemented in any other region to our knowledge. But I think that that is an approach that certainly could be used. And when I referred in my 
oral testimony to the address listing protocol. That is what I meant. And I, and I think that the Bureau has implemented a similar protocol for the targeted non-sheltered outdoor locations, but that is going to be essentially a one-day operation, and it will not it is primarily to reach the homeless. It will not necessarily reach any of the hardest count populations that we are concerned about. I noticed that uh, in Mr. Groh's testimony, I believe he said that there was an outreach to approximately 28,000, I guess, different government uh, uh, governments, whether it's city, county, state, uh, or tribal, or whatever. Uh, only about 14,000 of those had responded to, uh, I believe, being the program. Are you encouraging some of the local governments uh, where you're at? Because I know I read your protocol and uh, what you're talking about, people being familiar with the area uh, and the community being involved in this. Do you, do you see a role for some of these uh, uh, governments to, to play in it that, that uh, could help in that? Certainly, yes, and I, I think that the Census Bureau has a good partnership program and CRLA community outreach workers are a part um, of that program. We participate on complete count committees in many local jurisdictions and we encourage local jurisdictions to participate. One of the limitations of LUCA, however, is that community-based organizations cannot participate. And I think it would be an enormous benefit to local governments as well as to the Census Bureau to make use of the knowledge of community-based organizations on the ground in those uh, communities that could really provide assistance to very strapped local governments. Thank you. Dr. Groves, uh, it's good to see you again. And we do appreciate your feeling of your commitment to come in front of us often and let us ask you questions. Uh, one thing, one comment I will make, uh, you know, uh, Mr. McHenry mentioned the uh, cost overruns. I will tell you that I've had several people across the country in the real estate business tell me that the Census Bureau in different locations was paying anywhere from 52 to $55 a square foot for office buildings. And um, at some point, if you want to come by the office, I'll give you some of those locations because right now, typical office space is anywhere from eight to ten dollars a foot. So, you might want to check some of that out for your cost overrun. But Dr. Gross, does the Census Bureau pay any outside groups to address uh, uh, to add addresses to this master uh, address file? Do y'all contract with anybody? Pay anybody to do that? to add addresses to uh -huh. the file. Um, the, the, <clears throat> the base of the master address file for this decade uh, started with the 2000 census master address file. If you go back into the history of this, we assemble records uh, in that decade from various commercial sources, but we've been updating that now. So to know the origin of actually every address in there is kind of tough at this point. But this operation that we've done over this decade has, has relied heavily on the Postal Service. I don't know how you count that in your thoughts, but that's been a, a chief updating source for us. Okay. And one, for, one final question would be a short one, I think. Uh, how do you think the budget overruns in conducting the address canvassing over the summer will impact your ability to effectively administer the 2010 census. <clears throat> Those budget overruns are intolerable to me, Congressman. Um, and I believe, as I mentioned uh, previously, I think, to the committee, that part of it uh, was from a flaw in the cost modeling logic. That logic has been changed. Uh, the cost model, our big operation going forward, as you know, is a non-response follow-up operation. And uh, we're undergoing two independent cost modeling schemes. Uh, one has been uh, partially completed, the other's going on now. I want to compare multiple ways of estimating the cost uh, because I think that's the way to protect your, your uh, estimation. This is a very complicated process. I don't think, I don't want to imply that it's easy to do. It's very important, though, uh, to get this right. I am pleased uh, that this operation that we're doing right now called Group Quarters Validation, where we're going out to two million addresses, appears to be on time, on budget, uh, and that's a good thing. 
uh, we can't tolerate uh, these kind of overruns in our big operation, and it's not going to happen on my watch uh, uh, as long as I'm in this position anyway, I'll tell you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Westmore. Uh, Mr. Zenzer, have you had further results of reviews of the paper-based uh, operations con control system? If so, please detail some of your findings. Uh, sir, we don't have any further uh, results from the review of the paper-based operations control uh, system, but um, we include that system as a top risk to the, uh, to the census because of the uh, late change to paper-based operations. Uh, there's a lot of changes that have to be done to that system, and that has to be a front and center focus item for the census, and, and we count that as a major factor in, in trying to determine whether or not uh, the costs are going to be contained. I see. Dr. Groves, did you want to add I'd be happy anything? to come in. I mean, I agree. Sure. It, it's deserving of scrutiny by my two colleagues here and me continuously. Okay. Uh, we have a big test I want to announce uh, coming up in around Thanksgiving. That's a big deal for us. We got to we got to hit that. We hope to break the system in Thanksgiving, in order to make sure it's robust uh, for the real use. Thank you for that response, uh, Mr. Zenzer. How can the non-response uh, follow-up operations be made more efficient? Uh, please respond to the question in terms of cost and effectiveness. Uh, you do have some history with which to evaluate this, I, I assume. I didn't catch the last part of the question, the, uh, sir. No, I'm, I'm asking if you have any history to evaluate the non-response follow-up and its effectiveness and cost efficiency. Yes, sir. I think our uh, plan for evaluating non-response follow-up is to, um, uh, similar to how we handled address canvassing, is that uh, we dispatch teams out to the field to actually observe the non-response follow-up operation. And uh, by putting our folks out in the field and observing uh, how the enumerators are operating, we hope to identify problems early, alert the Census Bureau to those problems, and then they, they make changes. We did that, for example, with address canvassing when we observed uh, a number of uh, listers in five different regions that we were in not following procedures. They were supposed to go up and knock on the door so they could get a good map spot with the handheld computer. They weren't doing that. We alerted the uh, Census Bureau and they took corrective action. I think that's pretty much our strategy for uh, covering non-response follow-up. To, to what degree will the accuracy of the master address file be affected by the Census Bureau's inability to track schedules, costs, and risk management activities of this endeavor? Uh, do you have any figures for this? I don't think I have any, any figures for that, sir, but um, the construction of the master address file, as, as we've all testified here this morning, is, is a key um, key operation and what our suggestion is is that they do some some data analysis of the quality of the master address file right now uh, to include the how using housing unit estimates and some administrative records to match against the master address file to try to target those areas where there might be problems with the quality of the file what uh, specific risk management activities are behind schedule with regard to the master address file? Are behind schedule? Yes. Well, they have a, they, the Census Bureau's identified probably somewhere in the area of 24 high risk areas, uh, and they've, they're developing contingency plans for probably around 11 of those. One of those is called the, I um, have to get my glasses out, sir. Uh, one of those is called the Housing Unit Duplicates and Misses. It's a contingency uh, plan that they are working on, uh, but it's not completed. And I don't think they have any scheduled date for completing it. So I would, I would list that as a, uh, as a key area to, to uh, get some progress on. I see. Thank you for that response. Uh, Mr. Golden Kopp. Is it true that the FBI has continued to express concerns regarding the Bureau's uh, poor paper, ink, fingerprinting quality? Can the FBI guarantee 
a quick turnaround of the check results uh, following the fingerprint submissions. And if the FBI cannot guarantee a quick turnaround, what is the Bureau's contingency plan? Um, I'm not aware of any contingency plan that the Bureau would have if there, there is no quick turnaround. There, these operations are very short-lived, uh, and very often the people are hired and, and will be hired in, during non-response follow-up during the operation or right before it's to begin. So there's just really a very short window that the Bureau would have in order to conduct the, these fingerprints and get the results back. Um. How can, can best practices be utilized uh, to ensure the Bureau provides a more reliable cost estimate uh, for additional endeavors such as non-response follow-up, uh, when when especially in light of the 25 percent uh, over budget for address canvassing? Well, I, certainly the, the Bureau does need to rely on, on best practices and employ them. Um, GAO has put out a, a guide to best practices for, for cost estimation. Um, this has been a, a longstanding uh, weakness with the Bureau. What we've seen is that the, the, Bureau, the Bureau's cost estimates have lacked detailed documentation. Um, their, the sources and assumptions that they've made um, were, were very weak or, or lacking. Um, they were not comprehensive in the sense that all costs weren't included. Um, and one of the things I would just like to bring up right now, you know, we've heard talk, uh, Dr. Groves had mentioned about they're, they're revisiting the um, male response rate. Well, that has a huge impact for the final cost of the census. Um, a one percentage point change in response rate, either way, can have tens of millions of dollars worth of implications for the final cost of the census. So that would be something right off the bat that, you know, it's great that the Bureau is looking at that, but the question I would have is to what extent is, is that being reflected in their cost estimates? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chaffetz, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and again, thank you all. I, I, and I know you all believe that the integrity in the, uh, uh, in the process is paramount to successful completion and confidence by the American people. So, uh, Director uh, uh, Groves, uh, uh, I would like you to get as specific as you can about the policy and procedures, uh, hopefully they're written, is to the criteria what would exclude somebody from joining on and, and joining the census. You know, we hear reports about criminals being hired to conduct the census. That's concerning to a lot of people, including myself. But what point, at what threshold do you say this person is not qualified, and to what degree are people qualified even though they might have a criminal background? Um, I, I can supply that information as you as you might guess, uh, Congressman. Publishing that information would provide a set of people uh, information that would allow uh, them to game that system in a way that might be harmful to the safety of the U.S. public. Uh, I can tell you how we go about this. Um, we. We receive from the FBI uh, on those names or fingerprints that generate uh, a criminal history the nature of the offenses. Um, we, as you know, the FBI database doesn't often, er, doesn't completely give the disposition of all those offenses. Um, so we we review this, we give a chance uh, to the applicant uh, to uh, provide counter information. And there are a set of crimes that are basically more serious than others where the applicant would, would fall out. Um, I can tell you in the fingerprinting side uh, that about uh, 58 percent, I believe, of those uh, that had a criminal history come back from the FBI based on fingerprints were eliminated from the group. 42 percent uh, stayed in because these were crimes that were judged not to threaten the safety of the U.S. public. So, it, I mean, at least according to read, I'm reading on page 13 of the GAO report, uh, midway through the uh, first complete paragraph, of the 1,800 workers with criminal records, approximately 750, or 42 percent, were terminated 
So it would be the other way around. 58% were actually allowed to stay. Right? The number at 58 would be consistent. Why, how do we allow somebody with a criminal record to participate in the enumeration process of the United States Census? I mean, I can't think of any threshold that, would allow, that I would have any confidence in allowing somebody to go knock on grandma's door uh, and invite themselves in to, to, to further discuss very pertinent personal information. I, I don't understand what threshold of criminal activity is acceptable by the census. I'd be happy to go through this process if you'd like. Yeah, that's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> uh, the um, the, um, the 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 list of crimes that I talked about before are things that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the the uh, the process by which we make these judgments is totally driven by our concerns about the safety of the U.S. public. And so, why and, not exclude all of them? Uh, because in the judgment of uh, the process going on, these, these don't harm the safety of the American public. They can't. And that's a subjective point of view that you're just personally making in some, I mean, who's making I'd, these discussions? I'd, I'd be happy to review this with you uh, whenever you want, Congressman. Uh, right now would be ideal. I don't have the list of the offenses in front of me, but I could. Uh, I'm concerned that it's a subjective criteria. It's not an objective criteria. I think if you are going in and you're asking for personal sensitive information about their names, their addresses, about what my eight-year-old daughter's birthday is, I can't find anybody that with a criminal record that I would be comfortable giving that information to. Meanwhile, we have literally millions and millions and millions of good, hardworking, honest uh, Americans without criminal backgrounds that are just dying to get an employment. I, I can find no excuse for allowing somebody to deal with that sensitive information into the peop American people's homes. And it, the, based on the information I'm seeing, Mr. Chairman, we've got over a thousand of them at least. And that number is probably much, much greater than that. And I, I, I have a deep, deep concern. GAO points out that crimes such as rape, manslaughter, child abuse are being dismissed. I appreciate that. But there are a whole lot of other crimes that I wouldn't uh, express confidence in either. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I see that my time has expired. I, I just want, for the record, I would like to exercise my right to have five minutes to, to, uh, uh, for each member of the panel, and, but I want to be sensitive. and a, a another round of, of Fair enough. Of I questions. yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. My expired time. <laughs> Ms. Watson, you are record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, uh, I really want to thank you for having uh, this hearing today. I can't think of a more significant and a crucial hearing uh, when it relates to the Census Bureau's ongoing compilation of the master address file. And based on the time-tested theory that the quality of output can only be as good as the quality of input, the MAF is key to what we can expect to learn about the United States and the changes its population has gone in the last decade. I think everyone knows I come from the largest state in the Union, California, and uh, 38 million people, and we get uh, 2,000 immigrating into our state on a daily basis, and they uh, surprisingly don't all come from over the border. They come from across the Pacific. And so we're the first state in the Union that is a majority of minorities, and uh, that brings a whole lot of different qualities to the count. And um, I, I'm sorry I missed the first part of the panel, because I know you've given us very vital information. And so uh, I would like to know what challenges must be met to ensure a one-to-one -one match between the residents of the nation and the Census Bureau's address book, and who we know is likely to be left out or undercounted, misunderstood, or intimidated into concealment if the federal government's message, methods, or motives lack transparency. Now, uh, 
once every 10 years, I bring someone from the census into my office and I said, now let me tell you, if you're gonna get an accurate count in my district, you're gonna go upstairs over the liquor store, you're gonna come out on Sunday without your clipboard, and you're going to go to the playground at the school or at the church or at the park. Because that's where you're going to find a lot of people coming out of those cramped apartments uh, with their children. So, uh, so much depends on getting a picture of who we are in America and how we go about counting them. And so, if I can, uh, Dr. Groves, and if you've already addressed this, uh, then I'll take the record as my information. But an amendment has been proposed in the Senate's bill and uh, for fiscal appropriation bill for fiscal 2010 that would require the 2010 census to ask about uh, citizenship. And how do you believe this would affect the bill's ability to perform a full and accurate count? Thank you for the question. <clears throat> the, uh, as you may know, uh, we have printed uh, over 400 million forms already. I visited one of our facilities um, that had seven stacks of pallets in 400,000 square feet filled with printed forms, already stuffed, ready to be uh, delivered. Um, the, the most serious problem of changing uh, the census now uh, Dr. Groves, I, I know that I think staff has a photograph of the very senior saying, and, and I, I don't intend to take your time, and, and I ask that Mr. Chairman if you'd make your time whole, but there's a, a picture that you're referencing of those printed forms, and I thought it'd be a useful visual for uh, those here today. Whether, uh, it is, a, it is an impressive picture, I believe. Go ahead. You, uh, you, you may proceed, Ms. Watson. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Crow was okay. uh, oh, oh, yes, it is. So the Census Bureau, before I got there, followed uh, the, uh, the regulations on how we should behave. And in uh, 2007, the topics of the questionnaire were submitted uh, uh, to the Hill and for comment, for addition, uh, that, that was a moment to add uh, a topic. And then in the middle of 2008, we delivered to the Hill, according to regulations, the exact questions to be asked. Um, and at that time, there were no added questions asked. I can say with absolute confidence um, that if we add a question to this census questionnaire at this point, we will not deliver the reapportionment counts on December 31st, 2010. We will not provide the data for redistricting. We don't have enough time uh, to make these changes. Okay, let me just, uh, so you, what you're saying is that you have not considered immigration on this farm? Uh, I'm, I'm saying that the addition of a question about- No, uh, you have not. I just wanted to know, is there any indication, any question relative to immigration on the farm? Yes, not no. Not at all, not at all. Okay, all right. Uh, now, I'm also concerned about home foreclosure and the number of people who have been forced out of their homes and on the streets and uh, the rising jobless rates means more Americans are leaving their homes and living in uh, a constant shifting and non-traditional arrangement such as in their cars, uh, in tent cities, and um, on the couches of various friends and family members. And all the while, increased financial hardships may make some Americans less willing to cooperate with the census workers. What challenges has the economic and housing foreclosure crisis posed to the collection of a complete master address file? Uh, there, there are two things I'm worried about. Uh, I'm, I'm worried less about the master address file than the actual enumeration. Uh, the foreclosed homes, uh, I was in LA two days ago, are, are, are largely empty now. Some are, some are not habitable now. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna spend money on those houses by knocking on the door after we mail a questionnaire to those houses. So there's a cost implication of foreclosures. 
I'm also worried about the doubling up problem of, of homes that are the result of that foreclosure. There, um, we're redoubling our efforts to make sure people get the message, if you have some family members living with you in that state, to include them where they live with you, even though you may not think of them as part of your home permanently, because they don't have another residence, they need to be counted where they are. I, uh, in, and then the other thing you mentioned uh, is absolutely- What about those living in the cars? Yeah, in LA, I rode uh, uh, street after street where there are RVs parked one after the other, and they stay there for three days, and then they move to another neighborhood because of the parking regulations. There are people living in these RVs. These are people who were well off enough to have an RV two years ago, but that's all they have now. This is a challenge for us in what Ms. Jacobs talked about, this three-day period where we measure these non-traditional living situations. It's a new challenge for us. Uh, our local regional folks are all over this problem, but it's going to be a challenge. It, I will agree with you. I represent Los Angeles, Culver City, Hollywood, I see them on the streets every day. And um, an undercount has been constant in various areas. Every decade, there's an undercount. Therefore, the representation is off a little bit. The resources that would flow in, that would follow the numbers and various categories, uh, we lose. So it's really important. Um, I think that even numerators who have been incarcerated can be rehabilitated and can be very helpful in some areas of the community where they recognize these people and they feel more comfortable giving up the information about how many live in a particular house and so on. I mean, I have apartments in my district where they hotbed. There might be a dozen people in a one bedroom apartment somebody whose face might be familiar, somebody who has the charisma and so on, non-threatening type, could probably give us a more accurate number. So I'm all for uh, your figuring out ways to count these people. Um, I think my time might be up, but anyway, let me go on to Mr. Zinzer, and if it's up, Mr. Chairman, it's up, but we will have a second round of questions. Okay, all right. All right. Thank yeah, I'll you yield now. back and I'll wait. I thank the gentlewoman. Uh, Mr. McHenry, you're recognized for your second thank round Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goldenkoff, I want to start with you. I, I actually reviewed your, test, your Senate uh, report and, and testimony, and it's, it's, you've added quite a bit to your testimony today, but the one essential part that I, is largely the same, I believe, is, is dealing with the cost. Is, is that true? That's correct. Okay. Um, so forgive me if I'm referencing the Senate uh, section here, but um, you report, um, for example, the Bureau had planned for 25% of new hires to quit before, during, or soon after training. However, the national average was 16%. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Bureau officials said that not having to replace listers with inexperienced staff accelerated the pace of operation. Is that, it, it, the way you write that is that it's basically a report from the Bureau. Did you find that that was true based on your analysis? Well, did we, we did not independently confirm the numbers, but based on our knowledge of the census and census operations, we could see how that could be uh, both a cost savings and also uh, make the operation more efficient. Basically, among other things, it saves you training. For example, the people work all the way through. They're also more experienced. They know their jobs better. There's not that learning curve. So it would certainly make, make sense that would improve the pace of the operation. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting that, that perhaps that lesson alone to know that, you know, because of perhaps the economic situation that we're in, that people are sticking through the job. That's right? correct. And the applicants are, are, are stronger to begin with. That's correct. Right. So therefore, uh, we can, we, we see perhaps a better result from our um, non-response follow-up coming up based on that experience. It's possible. That, that, that's correct. There's a, you know, could, you, you can make the argument that there is a, a better workforce going into to non-response follow-up 
uh, you know, in the sense that they have employment, uh, unemployment history. Um, they have a work ethic. Um, in, in the past, the Census Bureau has relied on, and for the 2000 census, a part-time, part-time strategy, um, basically part-time employees, um, you know, underemployed people. Um, but to the extent that you have a very skilled workforce now that's looking for work, uh, those people tend yeah. to be better employees and okay. more responsible. Ad additionally, you said that um, there, uh, what, what was the key cost overrun? What was the largest failure of the Bureau with this cost overrun? Uh, there was actually several uh, reasons for it. I, um, a, I, I a, know a, in your report. A big report, reason was it, they underestimated the workload, um, the address canvassing workload. Um, there were additional, uh, I think around 11 million addresses, additional addresses that they hadn't counted on. Some of those came from Luca, some of those came from other sources. Each one of those addresses had to be verified mm -hmm. in the field, and that's um, yeah. labor intensive and costly. Sure. Um, and uh, it, you, you mentioned 11 million, which it says in your report that 11 million addresses were included that were not in their original 2009 budget. Is that true? That's correct. Okay. And that was one of the largest uh, in, uh, dollar amount increases. I, I believe so. That and the fact that they, they um, hired more listers than they needed to because they didn't stick to their staffing model. Okay. okay. Dr. Groves, um, in light of this, um, what are you doing to, to make sure that you don't have a massive cost overrun uh, for uh, all the process, uh, all the processes that we have going forward? Yeah, um, I mean a 25 percent cost overrun is extraordinary. I think there you could classify the things we're doing under two categories. One is. Um, uh, changing, uh, I, I view this as a combination of top-down cost modeling where you take uh, the 2,000 estimates, you update them by what has changed, and then you derive a new cost estimate uh, versus a bottom-up approach where you get the components of the activities, you cost each one, and you aggregate it up. Uh, the, the typical bureau approach is to do a top-down cost model those have been updated based on master address, ad address canvassing results, the new uh, hiring and attrition rates, and we've changed the staffing model going forward. So it, it took advantage of, of the information properly done. That's a good thing to do, but I don't think it's sufficient. And so we're, we're also building a model from the bottom up, getting activity level uh, uh, costs and then aggregating it up. And I want to compare those two aggregate cost okay. estimates. And, um, in sorry. my time has expired, but in closing, you know, you were here um, after the end when address canvassing had ended. That was about the approximate time you testified, and you didn't want to discuss the cost of this uh, in that hearing. Um, with a 25 percent cost overrun, it seems to me unfathomable that you did not know that there would be significant cost overruns. And what I've said in every meeting with you personally and public and mm -hmm. what the chairman has said as well, and I think just about every member of this committee, is that we want to be of assistance here. And if you keep us in the dark about challenges or problems, you know, in, including $88 million that was not, intent, was not budgeted for, it seems to me that you were not keeping us apprised of this, and that's rather disappointing. And I would hope that whoever is counseling you to, to hold back on that information, that you don't listen to that counsel, that you come forward and let us know as soon as problems occur, because we do want to be of assistance. We want to make sure that everything is there for you so you can have the best, most accurate count and I know that's what the Bureau wants. I know that's what you personally want. But you need to keep us informed on this. And a twi I can understand if you didn't know a 3% cost overrun, but 25%, for heaven's sakes, that seems to me unfathomable that you didn't know that. And so I would encourage you to come forward as soon as you know there are any problems or challenges, and we do want to be of assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, you, 
you, you mentioned in your testimony that many housing units of migrant and seasonal farm workers are not in the master address file because they are actively concealed. Uh, what do you mean by actively concealed? Well, I, I think there are several um, reasons for active concealment. And what I mean about that is that ranging from the owners and operators of that housing not wanting it to be seen and therefore uh, disguising it or hiding it as best they can, um, to the occupants of that housing not wanting to be discovered because they are living in what would be considered illegal um, units or um, living where they think they're not supposed to. For example, they're hidden under tarps and lean-tos in the canyons in San Diego County or in LA County in onion fields. They're living in between trees under tarps. Uh, the, these are circumstances where uh, they are trying uh, not to be seen because they will be dislocated from the housing, they might be evicted, they might be threatened um, if they remain there. And when the owners um, of the property or the owners of the illegal housing units uh, believe that they will be either prosecuted or sued, for example, by CRLA for maintaining uninhabitable dwellings for their workers, they will try to actively conceal those units. So that can be difficult for the Census Bureau, but I don't think active concealment is the biggest problem well, that we well, have. How, do, how can the uh, Census Bureau get a better count of these populations? Well, I think the example that we gave in our written testimony, which was also cited in 2003 by the um, GAO report on the address listing protocol that we used, is the best example. We have trusted faces in the community. We have reliable community outreach workers that work for local community-based organizations who know where this housing is located, who can work in partnership with the Census Bureau to assist both in address listing and in enumeration of these locations. They know where they are, they're trusted by the occupants, and they can go a long way to opening doors, so to speak, for the Census Bureau. You know, the deplorable conditions of housing for immigrant workers are not confined to migrant farm workers. Recent immigrants to this country uh, have the same living conditions in cities, uh, just as Ms. Watson pointed out. What are some examples of low visibility units in cities that do not have postal addresses, and how are they reached by census workers? I think that the problems in isolated rural areas and the, just the types of housing in which migrant and seasonal farm workers live are very similar to the small towns in agricultural communities as well as many of the inner city areas where there are illegal units that are being rented out. There are illegal garages that are being rented out underneath someone's porch is being rented out as a habitable, in quotes, uh, dwelling. Again, there's local knowledge of where these units are, and more importantly, I think that the Census Bureau's own hard-to-count database can be improved, enhanced, and utilized to target special um, enumeration procedures in areas that have a high concentration of hidden housing units. I think that can be used in rural areas as well as in inner city urban areas, and it should be, gone, be done regardless of whether those areas are considered mail-out, mail-back areas. They still need to be targeted for enumeration that is not done by mail, or we will miss not only entire housing units, but we will continue to have people omitted from households. You know, speaking of omissions, in 1990, it was estimated that 48 to 52 percent of the migrant seasonal farm workers were undercounted. Uh, a large part of the undercount was attributed to total household omissions. What is the extent of these problems leading, uh, heading into the 2010 decennial? What do you see them as? 
I, I believe that 2010 will have very similar problems. I give the Census Bureau credit for developing improved job aids and improved instructions and training to their address listers and enumerators, but I think that a lot more needs to be done in order to ensure that the locations are identified for the Census Bureau so that addresses can be added um, to the address file at any time through non-response follow-up as well as during the decade, um, and so that, again, these areas can be targeted for special enumeration procedures. What suggestions do you have for collaboration between the Bureau and groups like yours to get these uh, addresses in the file? Well, we certainly take advantage of the partnership opportunities that the Census Bureau offers, and we encourage and we train other community-based organizations to do the same. I think, however, that the Census Bureau could make better and more use of local knowledge and community-based organizations in its LUCA process, as well as in address canvassing and by using the special protocol that we described in our written testimony. Thank you so much for your response. A gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goldenkopf, I'd like to go back to the question you were doing with uh, Director Groves, uh, talking specifically about the criminal element that this seems to be acceptable at the Census Bureau. Can you give me your perspective on that situation? And are there criteria, the objective, the subjective? And how many people are we talking about here? Um, I, I don't know. We have not seen the actual list. I mean, obviously, some crimes are, are less severe than others, but which ones will allow you with census jobs and, and which ones will not, um, we don't know because we haven't seen the, the list. Is there any written criteria for this, or is this just something that is just done on the fly and, and very subjective? I don't, we have not looked into that, so I, I do not know. Sir, can I, can I address that? Yes, yes, please. Um, I became the IG of Commerce in... Uh, late December 07, January 08. By February of 08, we were alerting the department and the Census Bureau that they had to get on this fingerprint issue. Mm -hmm. And um, they weren't prepared for it. And it took them six to eight months to get ready for fingerprinting. And the original estimates for finger fingerprinting were up in the 600 and 700 million dollars. Our office worked with them for six or, six or seven months working on their cost estimate. There is criteria, and uh, there's criteria in other federal jobs also. My, my most recent experience before Commerce was the transportation and transportation security. There are common lists of offenses that the federal government refers to in terms of whether somebody's qualified or disqualified. One of the things we recommended for the Census Bureau was in the past they would let local or regional offices make determinations on which crimes are disqualifying and which crimes aren't. We recommended that they centralize that in an, in an office called CHEC. I can't tell you what that exactly stands for, but mm -hmm. there is an office in Census headquarters that has centralized these kind of determinations, and we think that's a good practice. Um, is, guess, there written, is there written criteria? Yes, there is. I think that doesn't eliminate all subjectivity. I think you do have to make uh, some judgments, for example, um, how long ago the offense occurred? Is it a misdemeanor? Is it a felony? Is it a violent crime, nonviolent crime? Uh, and I also know that they ha the Census Bureau has been consulting with the FBI on those types of, uh, types of issues. My concern is that we just are somewhat in the dark on this. And again, it's the, you know, giving the confidence and the, of the integrity of the process and the people that are gonna be knocking on their door. Because unlike most other federal jobs, you're actually gonna be going up and approaching somebody in their home and asking for sensitive information that can lead to other nefarious types of activities, and, and thus the concern. There are certainly a number of other types of government jobs that somebody with a criminal background can participate in, whether it's the Department of Transportation or member of Congress. I mean, whatever it might be, right? But in terms of the census, I think there's a great deal of sensitivity. Uh, going back to Director Groves, how many people are we talking about? Because at least the way I read and, and interpret, uh, interpret the numbers uh, from the, the GAO report, we're talking over 1,000 people. It's not a small, hey, we got a handful here or there. That's a, and I recognize the totality of the, the effort that's going on. But this seems like a rather large, and I, and I sense a degree of secrecy that you want to keep from this committee. Um, in allowing us to understand what is, you know, so they can't quote unquote game the system. 
that I just find wholly uh, unacceptable. And I think there is a great deal of fear that will be created probably on the other end of it by being so secretive about what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. I, I, I can say, Congressman, that the everything we do is in compliance with OPM guidelines that are indeed published. Uh, I could, uh, I don't have those with me, but I can supply those. So we're following that uh, as well as we can. I think the other thing to note, uh, just to make sure that I'm communicating the facts correctly, is that uh, the existence of uh, a record in the FBI doesn't uh, imply conviction of a crime. So if somebody has been charged with a crime but not convicted, are they allowed to be an enumerator? What happens then is that uh, the applicant is required by us to provide court uh, certified documentation on the outcome of the case. Um, and uh, are they, if, used, if they have not, following the OPM guidelines. If, and we're talking about tens of thousands of people here who have not completed the, the background process. That is, they have not had their, their fingerprinting processed by the FBI. Are those people allowed to start work even though they haven't completed that, that, uh, that process? Because it, it looks like, based on what's been going on and surveying and going out to all the neighborhoods and trying to figure out the maps and all that, that those people have actually been employed and working despite what ultimately concluded was unacceptable nefarious behavior. Yeah, this, this, um, this group has universally passed the FBI name check uh, that's based on name, date of birth, social security. And do, you use e, do you use E-Verify? Uh, we, no, we, we do use E-Verify as part of the employment process. In addition to that, then we do the FBI name check. So everyone has passed that. Uh, so all of those names have gone through the E-Verify process? All of those names have gone, to my knowledge, have gone through the E-Verify process. The uh, gentleman from Utah's I, time has Understood. Expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Just uh, briefly, Dr. Groves, are you... Uh, does the Bureau have a set of internal procedures and policies on what is a disqualifier in terms of criminal record? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Goldenkoff, has that been verified by yeah, GEO? We, we do have, yes. Yes. They, they do. Okay. Mr. Mr. Yes, Mr. yes, sir. I've seen okay. them. All right. Um, Mr. Gross, are you confident that there are no violent criminals that work for the Census Bureau? I, I'm confident that the people employed by the Census Bureau have gone through this process and have been okay. uh, judged as not having a, a criminal history under the process. Sure. And, and would the three of you uh, agree uh, to follow up with Mr. Chaffetz and his staff in, in regards sure. to his line of questioning? I'd be happy to. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you all for that, and thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. yield? Sure, sure. Thank you. I I won't keep everybody all day. I, I promise. I, I, they, they, I asked you. the chairman for one minute, so I think you've got to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. What percentage of the people going through the process go through the fingerprinting process? 100%. Is that correct? Uh, we don't hire anyone who doesn't pass the name check. All the people who pass the name check then are submitted to the fingerprinting, who, who we wish to hire are, are submitted. And how long does it take from the person, you know, they fill out their application, then you, I mean, uh, this the is FBI, done on are the they taking? The first day of training, uh, the, there are two cards made right. uh, by two different fingerprinters. Those cards are FedEx to our uh, National Processing Center, and then uh, electronically transmitted to the FBI. The turnaround time on the FBI was uh, in, the, in the last operation was about 22 hours. Uh, that process seems to be working. We beefed up the electronic pipeline uh, to that. So, um, and we're doing a big load test of that. Uh, we're going to simulate a, a million hires through the FBI submission process just to make sure we can do that volume when we have to. Biggest concern that you have at, at this moment, all things considered, what's your biggest concern? About what? About the the entire twenty. The entire process? the totality of the process. When you wake up in the morning and say, "Oh my goodness, this is my biggest concern," what would it be? Um, I'm most worried about the uh, the behavior of the American public. 
whether they will return this questionnaire at the rates we hope them uh, that we hope they will, and that the leadership of this country uh, ignites uh, and energizes themselves to encourage that uh, participation. We need, we need you at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. appreciate your help. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, the um, director couldn't summarize it better. Uh, thank, I want to thank the panel for your testimony today uh, and that concludes the uh, hearing. Hearing adjourned. A great life for a long time, but she seems to make him very happy. You know what? His girls, when he breaks up with them or however they go on their business, they never gossip about him. They just go on about their business. He buys them body parts and, and jewelry and stuff. <laughs> Listen, and, and treats them really well while they're together. I, I, that's my kind of guy. I like him. Okay. Have you guys seen the, um, the November issue of Elle magazine? Um, well, on the cover is Katie Holmes. There are actually two covers. That's one of them that you're looking at right now. And then they took another picture of her. But inside, you know, Katie is saying, and, and um, you know, by the way, she's 30, and Tom Cruise, her husband, is 47, that her husband often critiques her clothes. Here's the quote. He usually likes everything, but sometimes I'll walk out and he'll say, I think that dress might be wearing you. You don't need that. And she goes on to say that Tom has great taste. According to insiders, their three-year-old adorable diva daughter, Sari, has, this is according to Glamour.com, a wardrobe worth third, uh, $3 million. Designer clothes, including Roberto Cavalli, dresses made for her, yes. She's the youngest person to own a, a pair of Christian lubes, you know, the red bottoms. Um, Katie had them custom made for her, and this past weekend, you see that picture right there? She's in Boston hugging Starbucks. Look at her kitten heels and look at the attitude. <laughs> she is going to be some man's worst nightmare. <laughs> That right there is some high maintenance. And, and they, did you see the picture? She also drinks Pellegrino water. Look at that. A mess. But you know what? They waited so long to have her and everything. You know how kids are. They, they make us spoil them. Damn her, she's so cute. <laughs> uh, you know, before he became a two-time Academy Award winner, this actor had to sell his body for food and shelter. I didn't guess it. I'm shocked and appalled. You'll find out who I'm talking about in one more hot topic. And I think she'll always be Mrs. Brady to me. The wonderful Florence Henderson is here. If you've been hurt on the job, Chasen Boscolo can help you get the money and benefits you deserve. Call 1-800-728-5898.
This is Jeff Norman. He doesn't get health insurance from an employer, so he's been buying it himself for years. He's healthy, so he wonders why his rates keep going up. Liz Sloan wants health insurance, but doesn't think she can afford it. We're Assurant Health, and we've been customizing plans to meet the needs of individuals for over 110 years. For instance, with our two-year rate guarantee and healthy discount, Jeff will get 15% off his rate and lock in that rate for two years. For Liz, we offer plans that allow people like her to pay for only the benefits they need, saving them money. In fact, Liz could get up to $2 million of coverage for less than $100 per month. Unlike other health insurance companies that focus on corporations and treat everyone the same, Assurant Health is there for the individual. So if you need health insurance, call the number on your screen, visit our website, or contact your local agent. Call now to find out how you can save hundreds of dollars a year on your health insurance. Call 1-800-291-4218. And that's how Verizon Fios works. Any questions? So will the TV in my house look that amazing? Yep. Fios has 100% fiber optics straight to your home. And I get $150 back when I switch to Fios. That's correct. I, I got a question. I got a question. Is anybody here buying this? Read and weep, pal. Switch to Fios now and get $150 back. Unlike cable, Fios delivers 100% true fiber optics straight to your home for HD picture quality that beats cable and customer satisfaction, America's top-rated internet, and crystal clear phone service. All together for just $99.99 a month with a one-year agreement. Call 1-877-707-FIOS. Ask about additional packages with over 120 HD channels. That's way more than cable. All three amazing services together are just $99.99 a month with an incredible $150 back. Call 1-877-707-FIOS today. This is Fios. This is big. Save up to 80%. 91-point platinum band, not 5900, just 1490. Half-carat earrings and journey pendants, 159. Two to four carat tennis bracelets, 299 per carat. Our jewelry is guaranteed to appraise for double by Factory Direct, the jewelry exchange in Bethesda. The Office, tonight at 10 on My20. is best known as America's favorite TV mom. You know she played Carol Brady on the classic show, The Brady Bunch. And this year marks the show's 40th anniversary. Please welcome a lovely lady named Florence Henderson. <laughs> I am so happy to be here with you, Wendy. This is 75, America. You look terrific. Yes! <laughs> you look wonderful. You keep your body together. Your hair is gorgeous. Your Thank skin, you. your eyes, your outfit. Thank you. Gee. Wow. <laughs> What's your secret? Well, you know, I, I just feel it's very important to uh, take care of yourself inside, take mm -hmm. care of yourself outside. And, uh, you know, I noticed as I was getting older that a lot of my friends, my contemporaries, you know, were letting their bodies go, their makeup, you know, they were getting all getting tired, losing interest. Yes. And uh, it, it really upset me because I'm all about life and being positive and yeah. energetic. Congratulations. This is the 40th anniversary of the Brady Bunch. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Friday night. I <laughs> when I was in first grade, because I'm 45, so it'd be Friday night to be Brady Bunch, yeah. Partridge Family. Right. And the odd couple. Love American style. <laughs> right. My parents would say, don't watch, but I was. And of but course. like, yep, the odd couple, all that stuff. And so you, I mean, you, you know, your family is probably a big part of most of our families at this particular yes. or most of us. Um, I remember, and, and I have my own family now, but one of my favorite um episodes was when the boys were playing ball in the house. It, oh, yes. It wasn't my favorite episode until I had my own family. And now I do. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, the boys are the ball in the house and that vase. And they broke your oh, vase. Oh, yes. And well, that's, that's the, the best line. People say, would you just say that line? I go, don't play ball in the house. Yes! <laughs> and so look, and so, uh, Florence, America, we were going to get the clip, but it was $7,000. I know. Yes! 
you know what? The Par you gotta pay for that stuff. Yeah, Paramount Studios make a fortune. Yeah. Off of that. So I'll just describe it. Yeah. So, so look. <laughs> so all the kids were sitting at the table, and you were in the kitchen, and they were eating very slowly, and then the vase started to leak, and then they ate faster, and they played ball in the house, and yeah. you know, just another lesson. Listen, you always had great hair on the show. Um, I created those hairstyles. You know, as I look my back, I don't know one. what I was thinking. Some, sometimes. But that one right there took off that you have right there. That is yes. like this, the early 70s version of maybe the cake plus eight. My yes. mom had that hairstyle, including yes. the frosting and the flip. Yeah, now, now uh, also a lot of people tell me, young people say, you created the mullet that I did. Yes, you <laughs> did. <laughs> yeah, you did. Now, uh, d did you roller set? Did you wear that hair in real life when you socialized? Uh, that was my hair. That's your, that it, was your hair? Yeah, hair. that was just my hairdo. I always ch changed my hair. I always wanted to do something different. So sometimes it would be very short. The first year of the Brady Bunch, a lot of you don't know this, but that big blonde uh, head of hair yes. that I had was uh -huh. not mine because I had just done the movie The Song of Norway. And they had cut my hair and made the front of my hair very blonde. Gotcha. And then I had all these beautiful hair pieces. Uh -huh. So when I came back, my hair wasn't right for Carol Brady. So they put this wig on me, and I called it my bubble do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and that and that's was the, the, the early incarnation of the show. Um, I heard that you enjoy doing your own makeup. And even though we do have D'Angelo, we, you know, I have, you know, my makeup artist here at the show, but we have D'Angelo who does all the guests' makeup. And they were saying that you like to do your own. Well, I do. Because I have worked with great makeup artists like D'Angelo, whom I met, I did go in. I always give them the courtesy yes. to see. Are they happy with the way yes. I look? You know, do you want to do anything to me? And he said, oh, my gosh, no. But I've learned from people like D'Angelo because you don't always get a great makeup person. Not only that, but the, sometimes your makeup person misses the plane or whatever. Exactly. I love to do my own makeup. I mean, I don't for the show, uh -huh. but I, 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 you can, I identify with you. I can. In yeah. a pinch, I absolutely can. Uh, okay. I'm just so excited you're here. <laughs> so okay. am I. Back. I wish you'd get some energy, though, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Back in the day, yeah. the Brady Bunch and the Partridge family, they yes. were on at the same time. I think the Bradys were on for five years and the Partridge for four years? Uh, something like that. And you both, you both um, ended in 1974. That's right. So was their rivalry offset? Would the kids see one another? Would you would you go to each other's lots? Did you and Shirley Jones ever get into it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but Shirley and I have been friends. We started our careers together, oddly enough, and Richard Rogers mentored both of us, yeah. the great composer, and we have been friends all of these years and never any competition. Uh, I remember Ann B. Davis, uh, one time she played, you know, uh, my wonderful housekeeper. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> She's just so sweet. And uh, somebody asked the question, they said, are you, about the Brady Bunch, are you the family that sings? Yes. And I said, no, no that was... we're the family that acts. <laughs> <laughs> But somebody took that as a, as a dig, as but a I, we, we weren't a, a the, musical family in the beginning. Yeah, you know? the, the kids did do a little yeah. bit of singing and stuff, and then you guys spun off into a uh, cartoon. We I mean, spun off into everything. We just had a franchise. Everything. So now Robert Reed, a.k.a. Mike Brady, I mean, I would watch the show on black and white TV with rabbit ears, but yes. every once in a while on a Friday night, we would be over at my parents' friend's house. They might have had a color TV or, right. or whatnot, and I was able to see his eyes. Beautiful. His hair. Gorgeous. He, just gorgeous. Uh, just a devastatingly gorgeous man. I just, when I was a little kid, girl, I remember just having a crush on him. 6'5", gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it must have been very, very difficult for him, though, because as we all know, he was uh, closeted, but he was gay, or at least closeted to us in here, yes. you know, watching. Um, and, and if he could have just lived to these times, he could have yes. been free and out. How was it on the set? Well, we all knew. I, I think I was the first to know, but, uh, you know, we had so much respect for him as an actor, and I always had such compassion for Bob because uh, knowing he was gay and knowing he was playing the father of America, yes. and in, you know, 1970, they just wouldn't accept that. Yes. And so it was really difficult for him, and we were his family. He loved the kids. He loved yeah. me. And when he died, it, it broke our hearts. You yeah. definitely have something to teach the old dolls and the old dons. I got a lot to teach you yes. young dolls, too. Yes, yes. Yeah, girl. <laughs>
I see. Honey, I got the money, I got the experience. I <laughs> love it, love it. All right, let's talk about it. Okay, well, the Flow Club is, uh, really, it's, it's technology is simple. And for years, I was terrified of the computer. Absolutely terrified. I felt stupid. I didn't know anything about it. My kids would go, Mom, please, you've got to learn the computer. And then they're busy with their jobs and they didn't have time to have the patience with you. My mom and dad are both alive and they're both like 75 and 77, okay. spry and sexy like you. Well, here, are, how are they with the computer? They're really good, but I can understand th that when, you know, people, our grandparents, parents, whatever, they get older and they, we're too busy to teach them. So they can go to the Flow Club yeah. and, and people who are experienced with patience. Okay. Okay, this is a card. I'm going to give you one for your mother and one for your father. Thank you. It's a, th a, a three-month membership, and you can find out everything you want to know about the Flow Club. What's so great about it is that, you know, we have all North American uh, technical experts to help you. With cameras, computers. You can, you can call and uh, it's with your permission they access your computer and all you have to do is watch and learn you can ask questions you can stay on as long as you like you can call as often as you like this is a very and big it's deal. your your computer is very protected it's very secure they can really teach you how to protect your computer yes. and i have now learned folks i am so excited about this and it truly you to as you grow older you must challenge yourself yes. all the time you must keep learning i can now share emails i can now video conference i can now see my grandchildren uh, some in st louis some in florida i can i i, I i'm well, on facebook <laughs> more about Flow Club, go to wendyshow.com for more information. Thank you so much, Florence Henderson, for being I here. I love you. Can I come back? Ask Wendy is next. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. All new Wendy. It's Friday. Wendy starts your weekend with two hot stars from two hit shows. From Cougar Town, Brian Van Holt. And from Mad Men, Brian Bax. I've got to find something fabulous to wear. Plus, coming soon, Rosie Perez, Mario Lopez, and Paris Hilton. Friday on Wendy. What's your definition of good hair? America loves good hair. It's a celebration, rings the New York Times. Look at my ring, still there. Side splittingly funny hails the Washington Post. Does your wife let you touch her hair? Question is, do I let her touch mine? Good hair, rated PG 13 in theaters Friday. My whole life was a wreck. I wanted to do more. I knew I could do more. Everest was the answer. This is my school. Everest helped me so much. They worked around my schedule. Financial process is easy. Everything that you're going to do in the hospital, medical field, doctor's office, everything, you're going to do it here in the classroom. They want you to succeed. They make sure of it. They gave me training. They gave me knowledge. It was the best move I ever made. Make the call. It's so simple. If she can do it, you can do it. Pick up the phone and start on the road to a better life. So call. 1-800-781-7017. Everest for life. Meet Wendy. Not long ago, Wendy wasn't sure what to do with her life. Then she decided to train for a career as a medical assistant at Tess College of Technology. Now she has a satisfying career helping others. It didn't take Wendy long to train for her career thanks to Tess' flexible class schedules, financial aid for those who qualify, and career placement assistance. Like Wendy, you can be on your way to a medical career in less time than you might think. For a free brochure, call 888-989-4141. That's 888-989-4141. Hi, I'm Nicole. I hope that last commercial really got you thinking about your future. Training for a new career could be just what you need to help you gain more opportunities. And taking that first step is easy. All you have to do is call and ask for a brochure on career training. It'll give you more information and help answer any questions you might have. We're ready to take your call 24-7, so don't wait. Call right now and ask for your brochure. Call for a brochure at 888-989-4141. That's 888-989-4141. Call now.
National Floors Direct installed our carpet about three years ago. It was great. Then a few days ago, I noticed a small problem with one of the seams. One phone call, and they came to fix the problem free. Turns out they have a lifetime labor warranty. National Floors Direct offers free next day installation of beautiful name brand carpeting and hardwood flooring. And will beat anyone's price by 15% or it's free. Call 888-400-FLOOR. I won't buy carpet from anyone but National Floors Direct. Have your floors installed by October 31st and take an additional 5% off. Here's why you should train to become a dental assistant at Kaplan University. Their dental assisting program is hands-on and includes an externship, providing you with an opportunity to gain experience. Plus, when you're finished training, you could look forward to job opportunities in dental assisting. This is a great opportunity, not only to begin a career in the growing healthcare field, but to really make a difference in people's lives. For a brochure, call 888-738-4949. That's 888-738-4949. Call now. And how can I help you? Hi, Wendy. My name is Samantha. Hi, Samantha. How are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> so, Wendy, I got a really offensive Christmas gift from my stepmother last year. She is 5'4", about 110 pounds. Okay. Clearly, I'm not. Right. Okay? So, um, she had the nerve to give me Hip Hop Abs DVD <laughs> workout video equipped with tape measure. Okay. <laughs> so, Christmas is coming up. And I'm thinking revenge. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little anti-aging cream, oh. cellulite removal. Well, what do you think? here's what I think, Sam. I don't, I don't think you should be offended by getting the Hip Hop Abs DVD and the ab thing. Okay. Uh, that's not a bad gift. That oh. stuff is expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. But I'll give you that. <laughs> if you feel offended, and I kind of feel how you feel, yeah. uh, but not so much. Give her anti-age cream. Give, just, just <laughs> yes. you know, you know, uh, fine. Okay, I'll talk uh, you say but that. do it. Don't do it. Like, don't be like nasty when you give it to her. Right. But yes, you yes, good moisturizer would help your stepmother yes. just fine. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you, you Sam. Hi. Hi, Wendy. My name is Tammy. I have a 15-year-old daughter, and uh -oh. I want to know. <laughs> I want to know if it's okay to chaperone her dates when she starts dating me and my husband would like kind of group date. And you know what, you know, like be in the same movie theater but not in the same theater row or that's you, fine. You but... are about to have your daughter be a social leper. <laughs> no. My baby. Yeah. Is it, this is your only uh, child? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mom, yeah. let go. <laughs> just a little, just a little something. Uh -huh. You know, she's going to have her cell phone. Yeah. You're going to have your cell phone. Okay. You're going to know where she is. Mm -hmm. If she turns it on. No, you, she must turn it on or there'll be no more yeah. dating. You'll crack her skull. Definitely. See? Definitely. But, but please don't show up at the movie theater. Okay. If you want to make sure she's at that movie theater, mm -hmm. though, then just take note of what car she's in and maybe take the plate down and do a drive-by. <laughs> but don't go in. Okay. Okay? Okay. Please, don't do that to her. Okay. 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 Thanks, Mom. <laughs> we'll be back with... This is the moment. This is it. Michael Jackson's This Is It, rated PG, in theaters everywhere October 28th. Taking a family of four out for Chinese can cost over $50. But I can serve my family a meal that's just as delicious from Walmart for less. Just one Wan Chai Fairy Frozen Dinner a month saves us over $450 a year. Save money, live better. Walmart. To all the people who know more, but are valued less. To the ones who have a job, but want a career. The ones who get a pat on the back instead of the opportunities they deserve. Today is for you. At American Intercontinental University, today you can start working toward a career in business, information technology, criminal justice, and more. Call 877-248-8680. Not one day, this day. You decide where, when, and how you learn with instructors who know the industry. For nearly 40 years, AIU has offered undergraduate and graduate degrees in a variety of career-focused programs. Today I might becomes I will. Today, the new you begins. Call now for our complimentary guide, Career Choices for Today's Economy. 
Call 877-248-8680, 877-248-8680, or visit us online today. Who lives and who dies? My old friend. The unit. Tonight at 8 p.m. on My 20. Have you been hurt on the job? Do you need your workers' compensation benefits? Call Chasen Boscolo, 1-800-728-5898. Platinum, the lowest price in years. Compare this famous jeweler's one carat platinum ring for $9,700 with the jewelry exchange using perfectly matched diamonds for $2,190. Or their half carat platinum studs for $3,700 to ours for $690. The jewelry exchange in Bethesda. This is a special announcement. The public is entitled to purchase cars and homes seized by police and bank agents. An inventory of cars and homes are available now and will be sold to the public. Call 800-692-1250. Cars available from $500. Homes available from $199 a month. Down payment assistance available for those who qualify. For listings in your area, call 800-692-1250. That's 800-692-1250. This week on Divorce Court, did a wife's pampered pet put their marriage in the doghouse? He'd get hamburger, you'd feed the dog steak. She left out the white wine. Then, a love triangle heats up over a question of paternity. Don't be a man just when it's fun. Be a man when it counts. This week on Divorce Court. All this week at 5 on My 20. I want you at my party. If you're in the New York City area and you'd like to be a part of my live studio audience, go to wendyshow.com for free tickets. I'll see you soon. So busy socializing, I almost forgot what to do. We're back. We're doing Ask Wendy. How are you? Good. How are you, Wendy? My name is Frida. Hi, Frida. And so I really need your advice today. Okay. Okay, so my ex-boyfriend and I, we were together for about two years. We met on the train. And when we were together, we were talking about marriage, and he asked me to go window shopping and pick out a ring for him. Um, for me. Okay. So we did that. I picked out a fabulous diamond, kind of like yours. Uh -huh. um, so very unique, not nothing that anyone could just pick out. Right. So long story short, we're no longer together. And because we broke up because he's a lying dog. But check this. So yesterday, I'm sitting on the train going to work. Okay. And who's sitting diagonally across from me? His new fiance. <gasps> going through a bridal magazine wearing my ring. This sounds like a <laughs> lifetime movie. Okay, so wearing my ring and texting him and, you know, his big face on her uh, picture phone, on, on the phone. So you Same got up thing close that I used to, to her over Got her... very close. Oh, Frida. So I'm looking at her and I'm saying to myself, this used to be me two years ago. Oh, and Frida. I want to tell her that. So that's my question to you. Can I tell her? You used to be me two years ago. Okay, America, <laughs> don't judge me, but sometimes this is the kind of woman I can be. <laughs> I want you to tell her. <laughs> and then I want you to yes. tell me through email I will. everything that happened. When you understand. You know, understand. Yes. Wendy, this is my closure. Yes. This is my closure. Yes, so. got it. All right, Frida. <laughs> Thank you. Keep it where you got it. Layla Ali is here next. <laughs> Closed captioning for the Wendy Williams Show is brought to you by... Meet the one, Infusium 23, with an exclusive I-23 complex to transform hair for better than ever hair days every day. Meet the one, Infusium 23. The Nesquik Guide to Health and Happiness. Stay active. New 100 calorie Nesquik. Come to your happy place. We know everyone's looking for ways to save. Why not save on car insurance? Thanks. You're welcome. Get a free quote at progressive.com. This is Jeff Norman. He doesn't get health insurance from an employer, so he's been buying it himself for years. He's healthy, so he wonders why his rates keep going up. Liz Sloan wants health insurance, but doesn't think she can afford it. We're Assurant Health, and we've been customizing plans to meet the needs of individuals for over 110 years. For instance, with our two-year rate guarantee and healthy discount, Jeff will get 15% off his rate and lock in that rate for two years. For Liz, we offer plans that allow people like her to pay for only the benefits they need, saving them money. 
In fact, Liz could get up to $2 million of coverage for less than $100 per month. Unlike other health insurance companies that focus on corporations and treat everyone the same, Assurant Health is there for the individual. So if you need health insurance, call the number on your screen, visit our website, or contact your local agent. Call now to find out how you can save hundreds of dollars a year on your health insurance. Call 1-800-291-4218. Hi, I'm Ricky Sabago, customer care representative here at Cox in Northern Virginia. And this is Vince Willis. And I'm a Cox Field technician. When you call Cox, I'll help you set up your internet service. I'll make sure you have enough bandwidth for your whole family. And when I get your order from Ricky, I'll have all the info I need so I can correctly install your new internet, sometimes even on the same day. We work as a team so Cox can deliver the best service to Northern Virginia. If you ask me a question and then ask Ricky, you'll always get the same answer. The right one. But it's not just the best service and teamwork that Cox delivers. It's also incredibly fast internet delivered over our advanced fiber network with free features like our McAfee security suite and media store and share. We'll give you blazing fast Cox high speed internet that gets even greater speeds with power boost and 24 seven support from the whole Cox team all for just $39.99 a month. You can rely on us to do more for you because we know we can rely on each other. When you're ready to call Cox, we'll be ready to help. Heart, and she went on from throwing right hooks in the boxing ring to doing the quick step and the cha-cha and dancing with the stars. She's also a strong advocate for promoting kids' involvement in sports and athletics. Please welcome knockout Layla Ali. <laughs> Damn you in this body of yours. <laughs> I work hard. Yes, we know, we know. I'm up running at the crack of dawn. I so. heard you run five miles a day. Not every day. Okay. I try to do at least four times a week, yeah. Well, see, here's my connection with Layla. Um, the last time I saw you, you were on my radio show, and this was years ago, and after the show, you were on your way to do some good old-fashioned New York City shoe shopping, oh, yeah. and you were gonna pick up, I remember you told me, like eight pair of gator heels in various colors. You got a good memory. Yes. I don't even remember that. I can that. even tell you the brand. Gators? Maury. Oh, right. Okay, yes. yeah. I remember they were giving me some shoes. It's okay, a, whatever it was, you were right. going down to get them. And and then I asked you what size you were, because you and I are the same height, 5 feet 11. And you said you were size 11. Yes. And I immediately had a mental connection with you, because I also asked mm -hmm. you, you know me, ever inappropriate, how much you weigh. And you told <laughs> me you weighed 175 pounds. And I said, I weigh 175 pounds. And I remember <laughs> looking at you like really hard and saying, if I, I mean, hers is 175 pound athletic body. Mine is housewife of New Jersey. You, know. you got about 20 pounds carrying around all yeah. that weight up top there. They're nice though, aren't they? <laughs> hey, look. <laughs> I got the athletic boobs too. <laughs> look, I have this. Do you have this? Do you have no, any of this? No. I mean, I have some things. Uh, a yeah. But, yeah. I mean, especially after having a baby. Things happen. So I'm not the and, same. And so congratulations, thank you, thank though, you. on the baby. You're a lovely love artist. <laughs> You know, Layla, um, when I when I when I last God. saw you, you were going through um, separation, divorce, whatever it was mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. She's remarried to that former NFL uh, ball player, and he's a broadcaster, Curtis Conway, and they have little CJ who is just scrumptious. I just want to dip Thank him you. in syrup and eat him up. I miss him. <laughs> yeah, how did you and Big Curtis meet? We have a mutual friend that introduced us, and it was so funny because we actually lived in the same neighborhood, just five minutes away from each other, but we had never met. And I was going through my divorce, and I went over to his house for a fight party he was having, and that's when we met. So, and we've just been hooked up ever since. And now, what neighborhood is this? What city do you live in? I live in Los Angeles, uh -huh. but it's an area in the valley, uh -huh. like Calabasas, Woodland Hills area. Uh -huh. <clears throat> And how long have you guys been married? We've been married now, shh, like going on two years. Go no, it's been two years. No, yeah. we just had our second year anniversary. If my memory is bad from boxing, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you know what? I, we I call. <laughs> well, I'm like, well, how long have we been married? You've yeah. got, yeah, you've got the double thing because you got the boxing thing. I know you're joking about that. 
No, Girls don't get punched in the head, do they? Girl, yes. It's serious. Really? Yeah. We, and fight, then, we fight just like men fight to be fighting women instead of men. And then you, when you have a baby, you know, you push out, and you push out half your brain. We call it mother's memory. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't, okay. don't you find you have okay, a... Okay, I have a double then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you look beautiful on Dancing Thank with you. the Stars. Thank you. And now, one of the things, and, and she did Dancing with the Stars, by the way, just before she became pregnant. So you got in there, th there she was on the dance floor. Your partner was Maxim. our friend to the show, Maxim. Maxim happens to be tall or able to really hold a girl sturdy. Did he ever at any point flip you up or do any of that? No, you know, yeah. they usually end up putting the taller girls with Max yes. because the dancers are small and I'm, I'm a big girl. But yeah. no, I, there was a lot I couldn't do uh, because of my size. And yeah. I didn't want to do it, frankly. You know, I was, I was like, I'm not trying to be picked up and flipped around and trust that way anyway. Me he didn't want to yeah. carry that weight anyway. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, yeah. He always used to talk about, oh, you're a big chick. I'm like, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? <laughs> I, I love being a big girl. You know, it's, it's odd, America, and, and Layla knows this, and many girls who are our height. If you're not thin like a supermodel, then you really do kind of get looked at like a little bit of a freak show once you put on your five-inch heels. Because I know you like the heels, too. I put them on. I mean, I'm like 6'2 when I put my heels on. But I mean... Don't you love it? <laughs> and then you have to set people straight, you know? Yeah, I don't really have a problem with it. I mean, I think it's all in the way that you carry yourself. You yes. Know? And I carry myself with confidence. And if I feel like wearing heels, I will. But I do look like a giant most of the time on television because most... Uh, people on TV are small. Very small. I just look at them like, you're just small. Yes. I don't know what to tell you, you know. Yes, <laughs> yes. Now, now, Layla is one of, what, eight children? Yes. How's dad doing, He's Muhammad? doing very good. He has his good days and his bad days. Yeah. So for the most part, he's doing really well. Yeah. Do you get to see him often? Um, not as often as I would like because we're both busy. Yes. Um, but uh, I see him probably every few months. But I'd like to try to see him more now, especially with my son and his grandson. Do you yeah. live near any of your um, siblings for I, CJ to, you know, get the Ali flavor? I have two sisters that live in Los Angeles, oh, and my sister Hannah is my only full sister uh -huh. from the same mother, and gotcha. she's over all the time, yeah. you know, and then my oldest sister, May May. Who I love. Yeah, May May, <laughs> my girl. She comes around as well, so. May May is yeah. really nice. Well, um, I know that one of your big, um, big causes is that you want to get kids more involved with athletics, and I think this is a great thing. They got, keep, tell everybody about what you're doing and why. Well, you know what, I think that, uh, you know, I hear all the problems that we're having with um, childhood obesity, and I see kids running around overweight, and I feel so bad for them. And me being, you know, in the area, obviously, of health and fitness and being an athlete, people always used to come up to me and say, how do you stay fit? You know, how should I eat? What should I do? So I just really started getting involved with it. And, you know, I'm a part of the Women's Sports Foundation. I'm on the board of trustees, and we're, our whole goal is to keep girls active through sport um, and also give women a voice, you know, and make sure that we're not discriminated against. I'm also part of the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness. I get involved with campaigns like Subways, Fresh and Fit, anything that has to do I with fitness and kids. On. So you're transitioning from boxing and you're becoming um, a spokeswoman and, and you're putting your, a face to various causes. Exactly. I love that because you're only, what, 31? Yes. Look at that. So she's got her whole life ahead of her. You did wonderful work in boxing. Now you've got your husband and CJ and your causes. I saw you doing hair advertisements as well. I did a couple. I mean, a couple I've of hair. Done a I saw bit of your everything. wedding on the Style Network or something. Oh, yeah. I see well, you're look. doing you're doing big things. It's really good to see you again. Thank you. And please tell me. You look me. beautiful, and congratulations Thank for everything you. you do. I think I threatened you last time I was on your radio show. What I said, you Don't say? you talk about me, or I'll come back up here. <laughs> and give me the one, too. <laughs> I love this one. I love you a lot. And thank you. And tell your father I said, how you doing? Okay. All right. Log on to wendyshow.com for more information about Layla's charity. One more hot topic coming up next. Jumpstart a life. Donate your car, boat, or RV to Volunteers of America. We offer shelter from the storms of life for the homeless. Volunteers of America, help me find myself again. We never give up on at-risk kids. We serve the disadvantaged and find affordable housing for the elderly. Volunteers of America helps me live independently. Jumpstart a life. Donate your car, boat, or RV to Volunteers of America. Get a great tax deduction. Call 800-614-8894. This is a special announcement. The public is entitled to purchase cars and homes seized by police and bank agents. An inventory of cars and homes are available now and will be sold to the public. Call 800-692-1250.
Cars available from $500. Homes available from $199 a month. Down payment assistance available for those who qualify. For listings in your area, call 800-692-1250. That's 800-692-1250. National Floors Direct gave me a terrific quote on new carpeting, but when it came to getting it installed, I was a little nervous. Well, the installers at National Floors Direct were amazing. Every detail was perfect. I recommend them to everyone. National Floors Direct offers free next day installation of beautiful name brand carpeting and hardwood flooring, and will beat anyone's price by 15% or it's free. Call 888-400-FLOOR. I saved $500 and no payments for one year. Have your floors installed by October 31st and take an additional 5% off. I lost 40 pounds on Jenny Craig, and I didn't feel hungry. My secret? The Volumetrics menu, and it's the newest thing from Jenny. See, with Jenny, you get to eat bigger, healthier meals, so you can control your hunger and feel more satisfied while you're losing weight. Here's how it works. A Jenny Craig meal with Volumetrics compared to a typical meal. Both are equal calories. The choice is obvious. Call right now and lose 20 pounds for $20, plus the cost of food. Call 1-800-JENNY-20. Find out more about the Volumetrics menu. Call Jenny today.